Welcome in everyone! Welcome in! Today is a very, very exciting day because as you can see, we have a wonderful guest with us because today is the very first fish tank talk, which is a little series of uh, Twitch streams I want to do where I interview experts in the field of animal behavior in marine biology. And today we're absolutely excited to have with us uh, a world expert, Dr. Luke Randall. So Dr. Luke Randall is a reader in the School of Biology at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, affiliated with the Scottish Ocean Institute, the Sea Mammal Research Unit, the Center for Social Learning and Cognitive Evolution, and the Institute of Behavioral and Neural Sciences. During his impressive career, he has published over 112 peer-reviewed papers and co-authored one book. His research interests largely center around the evolution of learning, behavior, and communication with a special focus on marine mammals. I'm also lucky to have had Luke as one of my mentor and let's be real, unofficial supervisor <laughs> during my PhD. And I'm so, so excited to have him here today to talk about his career, sailing adventure, our time in the field, but also, and of course, well, dolphins and much more. Welcome in. Welcome, welcome. How's it going? <laughs> hey, hi. What a pleasure. <laughs> Hello, fellow Twitchers. This is Luke's first Twitch interview. He's been uh, part, yeah, you've been like on movie sets, you've been interviewed on TV, you've been interviewed on podcasts, but it's his very first Twitch interview. So we're at the forefront of science today, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> For someone like, let's say like someone like just clicked on the stream, they don't know who you are. How would like you yourself like describe your work and like your scientific contribution to someone that like you just met like at the airport or something? Right. Uh, <clears throat> so um, I guess most broadly, you'd have to say I study the evolution of um, uh, behavior uh, with a special focus on communication uh, and uh, this thing called social learning. Um, uh, but also uh, I have um, because a lot of my work has been focused on marine mammals. Um, uh, it, it, it's pretty hard not also to sort of do bits of work on their ecology uh, and conservation biology, for example. Um, <clears throat> I have at various times in my career strayed into uh, looking at human social learning, um, both empirically and, and theoretically. Um, and I, I also have a, um, uh, been working um, in more recent years um, with some fish, uh, particularly archfish, which is these... Uh, this sort of group of species that shoot their prey down. Um, but I started with um, <laughs> I, I, I started with cetaceans and and special, specifically sperm whales, and and I've and I've stayed uh, um, in uh, that you know that's been a, a long term theme that continues uh, to this day um, because it's a they are quite an incredible species. Um, although you know the first uh, cetacean that I met at sea and took photos of and things like that were, were actually bottlenose dolphins. So it all started with dolphins, yeah. It all started with dolphins in yeah. uh, in, in Cardigan Bay in, in Wales. Um, like, when was the moment that you were like, okay, like, I need to, like, study this animal or, like, I'm interested in, like, knowing, like, what's going on here? Uh, yeah, yeah. I just, I did some work experience when I was still at school, you know, and uh when you get towards the end of high school, they try and concentrate your mind on the fact that you're going to be kicked out into this world and they send you to, to various work experience things. And I managed to find somebody who was taking photos of bottlenose dolphins in Wales relatively close to where I grew up. And I went and spent uh, a week uh, with with him. Uh, and that uh, that sort of sparked the, uh, the fire that then led to me applying to study marine zoology at the University of Bangor uh, in North Wales. And at that point, if you'd met me in my first year, um, I would have told you that dolphins were where it's at. <laughs> um, and that, that's what I was going to do. Uh, but that didn't survive the first summer of my uh, undergraduate degree when um, I was lucky enough to be offered a, uh, a place on um, a boat called the Song of the Whale, uh, which was a research vessel operated by an NGO called the International Fund for Animal Welfare. Uh, and uh, with um, and the research was being led by someone called Dr. Jonathan Gordon, uh, who's uh, still up in, in, in Scotland now, and I, I saw him last week. So it's a very long long term friendship and, and relationship there. Uh, and he was uh, he and I four 
uh, were doing some work in the Azores, uh, which are a group of islands in the Mid Atlantic, um, and that it was at a time. So this was um, 1993, uh, and uh, what was interesting there was that the, there had been a long tradition of, of whaling, in fact, shore-based whaling in the Azores that had been introduced by the Yankee whalers, the, the Moby Dick era uh, whalers, when they gone into the uh, Azores and they left some of their catcher boats there. Um, and so they developed a system where they would, um, uh, the Azores are very mountainous islands, right? And so they'd build little towers up high up on these mountains and put someone up there with telescopes and um, binoculars and things like that. And so instead of sailing a ship out to where the whales were, the whales were actually, you know, coming around the islands quite a lot. And um, they had these these uh, folks go up to the towers with their binoculars and their telescopes. And when they saw uh, whales, they would fire a, a rocket uh, like a flare. Uh, and when the flare went up from the side of the mountain, then, you know, the, 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 the men in the village at that time would drop what they were doing and then run and get in these boats and row out and yeah. try and catch these sperm whales and then bring them to shore. Um, and um, they were doing this up to the through the 1980s, and it was you know, uh, and 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 we were we were at this when we were going there. It was a sort of transition point um, between uh, the whales as a as an economic resource uh, dead to the whales as an economic resource uh, alive, um, and we were sort of trying to map their distribution, where you were most likely to find them, and things like that, to support what was at the time like a really nascent early days whale watching industry with one or two operators um and uh, it, it, it was this kind of um so trying to support this transition between you know lethal use to um using them to generate uh, income uh, from a from an ecotourist perspective from a whale watching perspective so was uh, there like an overlap between like a, a time where they were still like actively whaling them, but then like the whale watching industry was kind of like, you know, like growing up as well? Like were you aware of like any tension between like the different actors? I would assume that the whale watchers wouldn't be like, or were they collaborating? Kind of like you watch the whales and then you call your whaler buddies? Yeah, <laughs> uh, no, it was, um, <clears throat> it had been banned, right? It was illegal. Yeah um uh, uh, uh as as part of the sort of moratorium and and uh but obviously there was a generational overlap a lot of the people who'd grown up with the whaling culture were still there um and some were a little bit resentful that they'd been shut down and skeptical about this um but um the the, the people who started it off you know they really did a, a, an amazing job of uh doing it in a in a sensitive um way as as much as they could um <clears throat> so for example the first whale watching operation actually was based in in what was the old um tri works the old place where they would, would process the whales and there was a whole lot of museum there about the, cult the culture and the background and things like that they used to really uh <clears throat> be really good at this uh at scrimshaw which is you know carving images into the sperm whales teeth uh, and <clears throat> one of the guys there found a, a thing called vegetable ivory, which is a particular kind of nut that you get in, and I don't know exactly where it comes from, but it has very similar material properties actually to to the teeth, very, very hard. And so you could actually do scrimshaw uh, on these um, <clears throat> on these uh, nuts, basically. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and he got some of the people who used to do it on teeth to do scrimshaw for him on these things, and he would sell it. Uh, it, it, as part of his operation, so he kind of kept that part of the culture going, um, and he also kept the, cult, the the bit where the, the you know the guys would go in the tower and try and spot the whales from shore, and he actually employed a couple of those people to go and spot whales for him, right? So he'd have a group of people in a boat, and they'd go out, and then the guy on the in the in the tower would have a VHF, and he'd say, "All right, I see some blows over here, or I see these guys," and he would help vector them into the to the whales. Um, yeah, yeah. So I first went there in that in that sort of uh, uh, in that period, um, and now it's like it's huge. I, the Azores is one of the world's kind of premier whale watching destinations. You know, I was speaking to someone last week who said, yeah, they went out, they did two trips on two different days. You know, the first one it's kind of rainy, a bit miserable, but they did see sperm whales, including a group with a calf and things like that. And then the next day they went out, and the weather was fantastic, and they saw I think six different species, oh my God. Uh, including. <laughs> 
from those whales and and things like that so it's a really you know interesting place it's part of the mid-atlantic uh chain of sort of volcanoes and things like that 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 um do interesting things with the ocean ecology in that in that area and nowadays we have you know there's a there's a really uh vibrant whale watching industry across the whole archipelago and uh there are students from uh here um <clears throat> not mine but but other others who are actually going out and researching those whales and 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 things like that so um <clears throat> that was my um uh, my first introduction to it we took we got on the boat in ireland and we sailed it to the azores and then i spent a summer basically sailing around there uh photographing um photo iding the whales you know finding out where they were and uh, things like that uh, to to give reports back to these um to the government and to the to the uh, uh, to the whale watchers about where you might be most likely to find whales and you know what what could we tell you about them biologically and uh, yeah, so at that point you kind of like went from like studying like just like dolphins to i'm assuming you were taking photos of like any whales you would encounter right so like just like going around and just yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so we had the we had the hydrophone set up so we were trapped you know finding the sperm whales acoustically and tracking them and and things like that and uh yeah, there, there was one, you know, very, very vivid uh, encounter, literally the first encounter. We sailed out of the port and, and we were kind of like, oh, this. Um, and it was kind of odd because it was a, uh, just a mother and a calf on their own, which obviously I didn't know that this was weird at the time, but you, yeah. know, you, you will know that now. And I... Um, <clears throat> um, the uh, the mother dived right and left the calf on the surface and for some reason the calf just decided that our boat was a uh, you know benign um, presence uh, and and perhaps one that they should cozy up to so for the duration <laughs> of the mother's dive this calf was kind of literally rubbing itself on the side of our boat right oh my you know, god just, it just came right over and just sat there and said right you're looking after me now you're babysitting me <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. and and uh, then uh, <clears throat> they um uh, you know and, and so for sort of 30 minutes we were all sitting there going what is going on right this, yeah 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 this, this this way, this <laughs> uh, i know and then the mother came back up and the, the calf swam up back over to her and that was that was the end of that right so but then that was like oh well yeah new priorities in life now <laughs> yeah yeah like that's well, when your brain was like okay like dolphins are lame i'm into sperm whales now <laughs> yeah 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 that's right uh, pretty much yeah pretty much and then yeah by the end of that summer i was kind of driving the boat behind the whales and taking photographs and stuff like that it's back in the film camera days so um we, d we didn't take as many photos <laughs> yes yes because so, like nowadays like when like so like for people that don't know uh luke did come with me in the field to take data for my phd and you know like we have dslr cameras right so you can just like shoot non-stop but i'm assuming back then like you had to like it was like it probably must have been like must, so stressful because like the whales like sperm whales like stay at the surface and they're like you know like just like hanging out and then eventually they dive and they'll die for like 30 minutes to like an hour and you don't know if you'll find them again so it must have been so stressful to just like wait for them to like show their fluke to dive it's like you got that one yeah yeah, yeah 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 and you got like 36 frames on a roll of film right and so you'd be like oh the whale's about to go but i've got oh no i've got two frames left what am i gonna do right these are really important <laughs> frames yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. and you don't want to take like duplicates i'm assuming like you want to keep your frames for like new whales i'm a yeah 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 because yeah. <laughs> it was expensive right the film was expensive and the, and and yeah you had to get it developed afterwards and and things like that right and you didn't know what you were shooting uh, yeah you couldn't so see the photos that's true yeah uh <laughs> i mean i went if we did a very long field season during my phd where we were sort of nine months in in chile uh in, in the waters of chile and and uh we shot like a hundred rolls of film right and i didn't see a single frame of that until we got back to 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 canada so oh you kind of like that was your phd data as well right so yeah. like if you have nothing <laughs> like it's like yeah, bye yeah, bye so <laughs> it was pretty anxious when you got the films and the developed and the and the um and the contact sheets out you know make sure it was all working but it was all good yeah we, we were doing it right so yeah yeah leaflet in the chat asked uh if you had hydrophones back then has that changed a lot as well or it's mostly like on the film camera front 
Um, no, it was it was actually you know surprisingly similar to what we use today. That was the you know the 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 song of the whale, and that program was the um, the main vehicle for developing these kind of towed hydrophones that you used in you know we used when we were in the field, um, and that that design pretty much hasn't changed uh, for that for that period of time what what has changed you know we call that the wet end the bit that goes in the water um what has changed is the dry end right because back then um uh we were using digital audio tapes or dat tapes uh which were like the pinnacle of technology at that point um <laughs> i mean when i came to how when i came to do my phd they didn't even have those and a lot of my phd data was collected on uh, uh the the old reel to reel uh tape yeah. so you'd have these two reels <laughs> and they'd last about 30 minutes and then you'd have to dash down below and kind of frantically wind this tape back into the machine and, and set it set it going again whereas now it just all goes into a computer and you can you know it's being um, processed in real time telling you what direction the animals are and you know you just press a button on the computer and make a recording as long as you like without having to worry about running out of tape or or, or anything like that right yeah, so uh, would you like pack the boat with like so much like, like I'm guessing like cases of like just like empty tape and film just to like, and that's like, that's as much as we have and like you kind of need to ration it almost, especially for yeah. like trips like when you were in Chile for like months and months and months. Yeah, 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 we took a lot of tapes down. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, for sure. And we obviously didn't capture as much as we otherwise would have, you know, because continuous recording that we can do now just wasn't. Uh, wasn't possible you know you yeah. had to wait until something interesting was happening so you'd have to be monitoring and then be like okay something out <laughs> get it going yeah do you <clears> think <throat> that we'll be able like now that we're able to get like so much data right so like during my phd like when we went like we were recording like 24 7 we had like tetrabytes upon tetrabytes like so many different photos do you think that like because of this like you know like like the the data that's available through like that those like technological advancements will be able to like you know like it's going to really like accelerate the science in the future years or you think that uh it's mostly uh, well like it, it i mean it, it definitely has right mm -hmm. um we you know, we miss much less <laughs> uh and uh you know the the quality of the photos and uh, has gone has gotten so much better there's sort of these little grainy black and white shots and stuff like that that you know there's none of that anymore that the, the photo quality is amazing mm -hmm. um and the uh recording quality is amazing but as you mentioned uh you end up with a lot of data and so yeah. it's uh it's it's that's now a major challenge i guess right mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you process those large amounts of data um by hand so we're doing uh i've, I've got a, a phd student that i'm co-supervising here who's whose sort of whole phd is basically dedicated on um developing and applying neural network deep learning models to to detecting animal sounds in in uh, um, acoustic uh, data because mm -hmm. we have these devices now that you can that are you know are not much bigger than a couple of these water bottles or something like that the sound <laughs> you, you can put them in the water and they can record for months and and uh, and you know you, you're going to sit there and kind of listen to it in real time or you no know, it would um it would be challenging for your mental health to, to do yeah. that. <laughs> As someone that sat down and re listened to recording in real time for hours and hours and hours, I can agree that it, is, <laughs> it gets to a point where it's challenging to your mental health. <laughs> you feel like you're becoming one with the animals in the sea. And like so much like the thing too is like so much of the recordings are not necessarily interesting, right? Because like you don't know, like especially if you have a sound trap, like you're not even there in the moment. So it's like when are whales coming in? But you don't want to miss them if they do come in at that one time. So you literally like have to like sit down and like listen uh, and, yeah. and pay attention because it can be like quite faint as well. And you need to be somewhat trained as to what that is too, right? Because if it's the first yeah. time you hear a well, you might think it's something different. Like they do sound quite strange. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And there are lots of sounds which you're not quite sure what they are. <laughs> yeah. 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 And you can't even listen to podcasts as you're doing it. That's right. <laughs> like you can't, like you literally can't do anything else. I remember like doing my PhD, like the first, like 
hundreds of hours that I listen, I was just like so focused and I would like, you need to take data as to what you're listening to, right? So like, if you're not hearing anything, you also need to mark that down because you don't want someone else to like go in and re-listen to that part of the recording. So like we had the system that like every 30 second chunk, I would write like, yes, I hear this. No, I don't hear that and keep going. So like every 30 second, you're kind of like updating this like giant Excel spreadsheet and like in the first hours i was like so stressed out that like every 30 seconds like did i miss something i would like backtrack and like re-listen to them and stuff but yeah no it's uh (laughs) yeah that's right uh yeah i had my challenges there so you marked up coders as well right the little patterns of clicks and stuff um you've talked about this i think on your on your channel uh Uh, yeah 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 so i was doing I was doing that where you you know had a neat bit of software that would kind of visually represent where it thought a click was, and then you'd have to go and sort of click on them and say, "Okay, this is one code of vocalization here, and this is another one and 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 things like that um and i I think I spent a good a solid like year and a half in my PhD literally just doing that <laughs> right and I analyzed uh, i'd uh, uh somewhere on my computer is uh I got to 10,000 coders, right? Yeah. Uh, that, that I'd done by hand. I'd, I'd marked 10,000 of these things. Yeah. And uh, I saved the 10,000th one. And it, it's somewhere on my on, Oh, on really? My sheet, oh, that's just as a fun. Sort of, like digital <laughs> memento, yeah. Yeah, oh, that's fun. Yeah, I think I ended up marking like 9,480-something. I should have like pushed it to like 10,000. If I, uh, right. I would have done it. Yeah. You were using the code sort of thing. Though. You were probably, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I say a year and a half. It wasn't literally a year and a half in the in front of the computer bit, but but I had a real to real machine next to my computer, so I'd be digitizing the the sounds oh, off these tapes. Because you had tape. to digitize the sound as well. Like it was not just the file. Yeah, yeah. Oh, because that's true. You know, we came back that's from, that's way worse. <laughs> we came, came back from the field with these stacks of real to real, so I had to set up the real to real and play it into the computer you know and then and then analyze and pull out the coders and things like that and uh, um yeah yeah that's what but it, you know if it doesn't get so boring it's it there's a risk it's going to do your head in i don't i don't i don't you know that's that's the nature of science right mm-hmm. you want you want the you want amounts of data that are just so huge that it is a challenge to 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 analyze them all right if you just yeah. do five what can you say with that right no it's so. true it's true we had a question from uh guitar zero that said what's the most interesting animal you have studied have you seen anything that shocked you while studying these creatures in terms of behavior oh uh yeah well yeah sperm whales are up there for sure <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it wouldn't be a conversation between me and you if, like, I wasn't, you know, bigging up the sperm whales in yeah. the face of your, your obvious dolphin, dolphinist. Yeah. Uh, so, so for people that don't know, just a little <laughs> bit of background. Uh, so, like, I studied sperm whale for my PhD uh, with Luke a big part of the time, and you know, my PhD is like mostly about sperm whale behavior. There are the species that I was like looking for uh, in the field, right? But I always like preferred dolphins. <laughs> So I'm a bit of a traitor to my own study species. <laughs> and I decided to study sperm whales because they're easier to study in the sense that we know a lot about them because of people uh, like Luke that like kind of like laid the groundwork for us to like kind of like come in and ask like those questions that relate to like, intelligence and culture and like, you know, like behavior and social structure and stuff. Um, but when we were in the field, I always got very excited when dolphins came. And uh, Luke always got very upset because when dolphins come, it like jams the signal. Like it makes it very, very hard to follow and study sperm whales when they're around. <laughs> and every time dolphins came, I was like, Luke, there's dolphins. Like, wake up. It's exciting. And he was like, no, my sperm whales. <laughs> <laughs> so we had this like little rivalry going on. So just yeah, a little yeah, yeah. background for everyone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and in terms of shocking bits of behavior, uh this this might be an opportunity to uh to play a couple of videos eh? um mm-hmm. because uh you know they continue to do that um they continue to surprise me and uh up 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 until the present day so for this this story what happened is that we were in the field and we were looking for sperm whale and what happens when uh when we're looking uh for sperm whale is that we track them like we listen for them and then we kind of like like we based on the hydrophone, we can know whether the whales are ahead of us, whether they're behind us, or whether they're on our sides, right? So we're just kind of like 
looking for those whales uh, all day. And like we, like I wake up and like Luke has been awake from like 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. And he's just kind of like looking for the sperm whales. And I wake up and he's like, oh, I just lost them. They just went quiet. Like, I don't know where they are. Just like go on deck and like I'll be listening in. And like, just like make sure that like, you know, like keep your eyes out to see if you like see them come to the surface, right? Because the sun had just come out. So you can like see them breathe at the surface and then we could like kind of like hone in on them. It was like, they were super loud, but they went quiet. Um, so then I'm at the surface and I'm just like looking out and the sun is rising and I'm like, oh, and I start like seeing those like black triangles on the surface and orcas are super, super rare in the Caribbean. Like there's very few sightings of them. So at first I'm like, this looks like a very big dorsal fin. It's way too big to be like, you know, like a pantropical dolphin or like Fraser dolphin, like even like pilot whales, which are like common in the area. But I'm like, it's probably not orcas because <laughs> like I just wouldn't believe it. But like deep down, I was like, this is very suspicious. So then I'm like, look, like I'm seeing black triangles. And he's like, what do you mean black triangles? I'm like, well, there's like black fins on the horizon. So then like we kind of like go to investigate. And then uh, and then this happens. So uh, I'll uh, I'll cue in. No, this this happens a bit later, didn't it? I mean, that, <laughs> just to pick up from that bit of the story, because it's it, yeah, you know, it's really interesting. I've never seen this uh until then um but you know we got to where the black fins were and yeah they were they were they were orcas uh but there was also this do you remember there was this sort of oily patch mm -hmm. uh on, yeah, the, yeah, on, yeah. on like... the water and the the orcas were all there diving at the sort of windward end of this patch so the oil was clearly arriving at the surface and getting blown down from wherever yeah. the source was um and uh um not only that but then um i mean liz and i got very clear views of animals surfacing with with big with ch chunks yeah of i saw that red too yeah. meat in their in in their mouths you know so so we didn't actually see the event itself but it's pretty clear what <laughs> what had happened right so yeah. there's yeah, a group like of whales that we had been following had encountered these orcas and the orcas had, had basically uh had one right and and yeah. they so we kind of hung around there and watched this happen and then they started to move off you know i guess they'd finished what they were doing and they started to move off and this is kind of crucial for orca behavior which is where you know they are at their most jovial i suppose <laughs> once when when they have just had a kill when they have just uh you know so so Usually, if you're a mammal-eating orca, you have to shut up because uh, other the, your prey can hear you, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so they often have intense vocalization bouts as well after a after a kill. That's been that's been published, um, mm -hmm. and so they just seem to have more time for curiosity and and things like that. So as we then approach them to try and get some I, more IDs, I mean there were a lot, right? I mean they, oh, there were so many. Of, I think we ID'd at the end of the day like over fifteen different individuals. Yeah in right, the area like yeah. multiple males multiple females and like they were they were like very happy about that snack <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> like you guys well yeah they kind of popped up we'll, we'll show you so i'm just gonna but go then, then, the yeah, then they got to be curious about us as well <laughs> yeah so that was like right after so like we just like came in and now the or like the orcas are just like you know like the oil is on the water we see them eating and then this this happens um so so this is the video Time. Hello, oh, Mr. Orca. Get the sound on that as well, yeah, yeah, they have the sound. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Mrs. Orca. Another back here. I, I um, completely Hello, misgender this, this animal and I get corrected. <laughs> yeah, so this is really rare footage of Caribbean orcas and really rare footage of orcas like coming that close to boats, right? <laughs> and yeah. we were surrounded so during this clip i'm at the bow of the boat and they're just like orcas like bow riding on the boat and luke is in the back here and they're just like taking photos because we can identify orcas based on their fins yeah <laughs> and then there's the crew <laughs> having their yeah. breakfast the best oatmeal of your life for sure <laughs> <laughs> and we were surrounded, like they were just coming oh from God, all sides. <laughs> right, in they come. Oof. <clears throat> yeah, and they were like upside down. They were coming to, and like obviously like checking us out. Like you, you could you could tell they were they're like, very. They're having you? fun. <laughs> Are you a big whale? Can we take you down? <laughs> Do not hit the propeller, Jesus. Yeah. 
so at that point I'm like, oh my god, I, I better put the engine in neutral because you know they, I was worried that I mean they were going right under where the propeller was and did not want to have any any chopping of the orca. Yeah, yeah, they were like right, right in front of us. We have. Do you want to queue in the other cliff right away? I mean, we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why not? Yeah. yeah. It's all. And that lasted for like a good like 30 minutes, I think. Oh, maybe. I think. oh it was, it, uh, yeah, I mean, it was a good, uh, I don't think we left them until you know, well into the middle of the day, really, because they yeah. started traveling up the, this is off St. Vincent, they started traveling up the coast there. And, um, you, you get a sense of how many, you, know, you see some off in the distance, and um, yeah, they were on the other side of us as well. Everyone was going a bit, um, yeah, we were like full on surrounded because I was at the bow of the ship and right now this video is from the, the stern, so like the back and they were like at the like bow riding too, like like, like kind of like how you would expect dolphins like in front of like sail, like ships and yeah. stuff. Yeah. They were doing that and just like peeking and looking at us Amazing. from all sides. Paul is asking why they did this. I mean, I think that like as Luke said, like they often get quite social after they after a kill. And I think that we just happened to be there and they thought we were yeah. fun. <laughs> there, there is that. There's also the curiosity aspect of it, right? So, you know, is this, what is this? Uh, mm -hmm. Could we could we also eat that? <laughs> you know, or um, what is this spinny thing? And uh, do they, you know, are they into the sensation of the water going over them? Or just this general, yeah, in, I, I got the sense of just curiosity, just intense curiosity. Yeah. Like, like, what is that? Um, and I think if we had been edible, that curiosity would have rapidly, you know, <laughs> advanced into um, quite uh, quite a tricky situation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what's interesting, yeah, we see this. Um, there's a, there's an ongoing situation off the coast of uh, the Atlantic coast of um, Spain, just at the mouth of the Straits of Gibraltar, there, with a pod of killer whales. That's um, you might have seen this on the news. Started, you know straight up attacking boats uh small boats small yachts a bit like ours um and they they approach them they ram the rudders they do damage they cause injury because people have been holding the wheel when the rudders got rammed and the jerking of the wheel has caused uh, shoulder and arm injuries and things like that um and i think recently they actually succeeded in, in in sinking a boat because they damaged the rudder so much that water then started to come in uh, and nobody was hurt Unfortunately, but there's this kind of ongoing situation there where there's a there's a there's a pod or a group of pods of of orca there who've decided that this is a fun thing to do and they are now doing it and you know there's navigation advisories to just not go through that area if you're in a small boat and uh, and things like that um, because it's a it's a risk and they're obviously not getting much nutrition out of it mm -hmm. um, but it's some kind of fad it's cultural behavior this is what i, I was um at the meeting of the spanish cetacean society in ibiza um towards the end of last year and uh the 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 scientist who's been tasked by the spanish government with researching and understanding this behavior was presenting what they knew about it you know and he was kind of like never seen it anywhere else this is a cultural thing that is specific to this pod but we don't know we don't know why right but mm -hmm. but but they attract it down to the one female that started doing it and then shown how it had spread to other animals um during the the course that the you know over time it spread to other animals in that in that group and uh no idea what it was whether it's a result of an adverse interaction with that one female that led them to become very aggressive or whatever or whether that one female just thought it was an interesting way to play with things in the, in the sea yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, a complete mystery on that. But we know that it started with one female and then it spread to other members of the, of the group. And now it's actually, you know, a threat to, 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 you know, human navigation. Yeah. Um, but I don't think that was what was happening here. No, uh, no, <laughs> which is good, which is good. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I saw a question sweep by there about whether we have underwater drones yes, as well. Yes, I was um, going to ask you. Um, excuse me. And the answer is no. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I don't have a particularly good reason why. We do have 
the old GoPro on a stick uh, scenario going on sometimes. Um, but the trouble with underwater footage is the visibility is typically so poor. Um, even in clear water, these animals just disappear when you're, um, you know, I've got lots of examples where they're like, oh my God, they're right there. And you put the GoPro in and you can't, you can't see them, even though they might be just 20 or 30 meters off from your boat. So, um, and also that would be pretty vulnerable, <laughs> I guess, to curious orchids and, and things like that. Sperm whales also get curious as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I do remember one when we started working in Dominica, the uh, the whale that became famous, Scar, right? The one that our first encounter with that whale, um, it sort of was really curious about the hydrophone. They often are quite curious about the hydrophone because it's this kind of 100 meter cable that comes off the back of the boat into their habitat. And they're like, what is this? And it's got this big oil filled tube at the end and, and things like that. Um, <clears throat> and it came it came right up to the back of, the boat and took this uh, cable. So the hydrophone cable is Kevlar reinforced. It's actually um, it, it's a kind of uh, cable that's produced for lifts, uh, like elevators in buildings, uh, and it is reinforced such that it can kind of support the elevator if everything else fails. Like the control cable will also keep it up. So it's really tough uh, cable. Uh, and it came up to the boat and I saw it put its open its mouth and, and just kind of come really delicately up to the to the hydrophone cable so that it was kind of draping over its lower jaw, you know, between its between its teeth kind of thing. And then it just kind of drifted down the way and it's like it was rubbing the cable across its uh, gums between its teeth as it was going down and it disappeared down and I was holding the cable thinking oh my god I'm, you know any moment it's gonna it's gonna chomp down and there's gonna be you know 10 tons of sperm whale on the end of the, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you could you could feel it twanging as the as the animal was going down and and um you know we are still friends with that animal because it didn't actually cause any damage yeah. at all it's just kind of really curious and um took the opportunity to do a bit of flossing, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's it's so interesting because I'm assuming like, you know, like those whales, they, they see a lot of uh, of sailboats, right? Like you're in the Caribbean, like so many people have sailboats around and they're just like, you know, like passing by. But our sailboat, like it, we're like a normal sailboat, but then we have this like super long tail in the water. And I feel like they get very interested about that. It's once again, like that curiosity of like, what, like that boat is different. Like, what are they doing? And I've had like, like you were there, I think, for this one, where like a juvenile, like a young whale, like it was the morning once again, we're tracking whales. And we're like, okay, like we're at the point where like everybody's on deck. We're just like trying to like get like a visual on them. Uh, because like to answer Leaflet's question and kind of like tie it in of like which family of whale was being eaten by the orcas uh, is that we don't know. So we need to get like a photo of the fluke of the whale to know who it is. Like that's how we keep track of who's who. So like while with the orcas or like with the bonos dolphins, it's the dorsal fins. Uh, that you take photos of with the sperm whales, it's the fluke, right? So like their tail, and they only show their tail, or like they typically show their tail when they're diving. So unless we get photos of the whales, we have no idea who they are. Uh, so often we'll be like with sperm whales, and we'll be like, "Who are you?" Like we, like, you know, like literally, like we ask that to the whales like every day. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and then like they show their tail, and we're able to like gather the data. So we don't know who the whales were for the orcas. And in the morning, it's always very, you know, like kind of an anxious time because you've been following those whales sometimes like all night and you're like finally we'll find out who those whales are like are they whales that we've known before are they whales that like have been documented for a long time in the regions are they new whales are they whales that we saw like two weeks ago around a different island so it's always very exciting to get that like first photo and then try to see like who it is and I was there in the morning and I was like oh like there's like a whale just popped off and then the whale just kept like circling behind us like behind the boat and just like screaming like the equivalent of like what would be screaming at the hydrophone like someone was downstairs like listening in and it was just like making like creaks like so so loud on the hydrophone like you could hear it like out of the headphones kind of thing. yeah and the well just kept like being like behind us but then we needed to like you know like orient to take a photo of it but it kept it kind of like ended up being like you know like a circle of the well following us and us following them yeah. Uh, <laughs> so that happens. <laughs> yeah, they they echolocate right on the end of the hydrophone because it's kind of really curious. 
because the the oil in the in the tube is transparent to their sound so they can see all the the wires and the or see they can sense probably the wires and the hydrophone elements and the preamplifiers that are all in that in that tube and so it's quite often that they decide to really investigate that and then you just have to kind of lift the yeah, <laughs> it's off the ears because and like sometimes we'll be like very focusing on like a distant well, and then one will come in really close and be like, <laughs> <laughs> all the lights on the recorder go red and all the, yeah, all like the, the thing is like, like exploding and stuff. It's like it's pretty, it's it's uh, it's pretty intense. Yeah, um, we have a video of uh, we have a video of um, mm-hmm. um, that kind of curiosity, right? Yep, yep, I'll cue it in. I've never seen anything like this. So in this case, it was like seven like young sperm whales coming to get us. Yeah, we can talk about that. Yep. <laughs> so like what you said, the surface is their nose. Hey, buddy. Say <laughs> hi. That's not an adult, surely. Oh my God. <laughs> hey! There's no, there's no, right there. And this one was particularly funny because, like, obviously, this one younger whale like came oh like close to the boat, but there was like five in the back, just like peeking out, like looking at it as it was like approaching us. Yeah, they're very cute. <laughs> no, no, not the hydrophone. Who are you? Yeah, there it is, the who are you? <laughs> they, all, they all look small. <laughs> yeah, see, there's like a bunch in the back, just like kind of looking, but not really. <laughs> But yeah, so that was yeah. Wasn't... Yeah, go for it. Well, I mean, my memory of it was that that animal that approached us was like the largest one of that particular surface cluster, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why I said, but I don't think it's an adult or something like that at the at the start, because we thought we were being approached by maybe there was one adult babysitting, but when it got closer, it's kind of like, no, that's that's not an adult sized whale. It's still juvenile but the others were even smaller they were like calves yeah yeah and usually you know what was interesting about that is that you know usually there are some adults left at the surface to to look after the calves and things like this but this seemed like well you know um marge my (laughs) slightly (laughs) getting older daughter it's time you started taking some responsibility around here so we're gonna go and feed and you got to look after the 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 babies right so if anything shows up you're the one who has to go check it out because the animals you see in the background were actually really quite small yeah. uh calves, and they're obviously they're, they're they're obviously very vulnerable um uh to that so um uh yeah it's it was like and we i i'd never seen that before and I don't think it had been seen before in the in the in the population we were studying either, because typically you get one or two calves in a social unit, but this was like four or five, right? Mm-hmm. So it's a lot, a lot of calves, uh, and, and maybe at that point it just gets the adults are like, we can't babysit all of you. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got we got to eat, right? Uh, yeah. So so let's leave you with the uh, you know the. Uh, the teenage daughter as it were as a babysitter and uh we'll go feed and so this animal was very diligently you know checking out what what the hell we were um and making sure we weren't going to be a threat to the to the little ones or something at least that's my interpretation obviously yeah we yeah you yeah, no, I, I think you're right I think you're behavior right. all the time but it was kind of like a crash right like a uh a sperm whale crash where they just left all the calves together in one in one spot and said you know, don't get in trouble, kids. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like to, we're hungry, it's time to go. But like, listen please, to what your like, big nothing happens. Tells you to do, and you know, we'll see you in in an hour. Um, <clears throat> and never, never seen that before. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, but it was very positive, right? Because that's a lot of calves, uh, and uh, so that that's always good to see. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, it, it means that that, like, family at least, was doing, was doing <clears> this. <throat> uh, Golden Unicorn in the chat asks, are they still breastfeeding at that age? Um, I'm pretty sure some of them were still of, yeah, they were not weaned yet, but just yeah. because of their size, right? Um, we don't know a whole lot about that process. Um, I mean, we've only, we always used to think that calves just had to stay at the surface, but then when another colleague of ours, Shane, put a, put a, a time depth recording tag on, um, a quite a small calf, he showed that actually it was when the adults dive, the calf was able to follow down to about 200 meters of depth before it gave up and went back to the surface. So there's obviously some, I don't think they're, they're born able to forage at depth, uh, certainly not physiologically able to dive down to in excess of 500 meters, which we think is probably what they're doing all the time, sometimes up to 800, 1,000 meters. Um, the record is, you know, two and a half kilometers or something like that. And uh, so at that point, they're kind of... Um, <clears throat> they're kind of dependent on them on their mother's milk but the mothers are not capital breeders right they don't they don't take on a bunch of energy and then transfer it in one go um to to the calf this process takes years um i i think there are there are accounts from the whaling era of animals that were aged in excess of 10 years still having evidence of um of milk in their stomachs right um and that was probably an extreme i suspect most of them are weaned by the time they're four or five years old but it, it's going to be a gradual you know process of one food source coming up from the other and then there's probably a little bit of parent offspring conflict involved you know the mum mm -hmm. doesn't want to spend their entire life feeding this yeah. this one calf <laughs> they, they want to go and make another calf uh, and so you know it's time it's time to to move on and start start doing that but yeah and and of course that creates the dilemma that probably underlies a lot of the social evolution of these animals that that the at the, the 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 mothers still have to feed uh, at considerable depths in excess of what the, where their calves can physiologically follow them for you know several years while the calves are still dependent on them um yeah. and so you know, given the investment that every calf represents for a female sperm whale, um, figuring out, you know, evolving some kind of social system that would allow you to perhaps reciprocally care for calves um, of your sisters or your, you know, your aunts or, 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 or that kind of thing, um, uh, while they have to be left at the surface in this vulnerable condition is, is probably, well, we, th we think, um, Fish and I and others <laughs> think that um, we we um, <clears throat> uh, that, that that underpins a lot of you know why they have the social structure that they do. Yeah, yeah, it really like highlights the importance of having like that family group, like those mothers and aunts and like you know like teenagers to rely on, so yeah. that like the calves are safe at the, safe at the surface while the females can like go down. Yeah. Um, and forage, which is which is super neat. Yeah. And so, then, like, once you have that, like, social structure, you can, like, build on it and, like, it gets, yeah. like, even more complicated. The question um, was how you get those, uh, the question in the chat there about how you get the tags on. Uh, the, the, these tags have been put on a variety of species, and um, I think most of the sperm whale ones are put on with very long, counterweighted carbon fiber poles that, that mm -hmm. um, uh, and this was not, us. This was a, a, a colleague of ours who was sort of collaborator on this project, but Shane Garrow has been running this Dominica Spoonwell project since 2005, uh, and he he has um, he, he charters boats there, goes out with a big pole, and you basically sneak up behind them, and then um, with a little bit of skill <laughs> and a flexible pole, you sort of flex the pole and the flex of it smacks this suction cup tag and they they, they adhere with suction cups um, and they, they typically stay on for um, well you can program them to come off after a set period of time but even if you didn't they probably wouldn't last much longer than 24 to 48 hours not least yeah. because the animals are often interacting with each other as you saw in some of the previous yeah. days and, <laughs> and that, that the suction cup wouldn't attachment wouldn't stand up to that it would just knock the knock the tag off yeah, there are there are that, oh sorry sorry go for it no go you you, you oh you go. I, I was just about to say someone that was there when we were tagged like that 
try to tag whales with which ain't it's quite a tricky process because you don't want the tag because like certain tags will attach like underneath the skin of the animals like big satellite tags and bigger tags but that can like lead to infection and it's much more cumbersome to the whales uh so like the suction cup cat tag like advantage is that like it's temporary and it like doesn't hurt the whales uh w which is really good and it doesn't like lead to infection or anything and like if the whale like rubs it off it rubs off right so it's not like something that like it can like you know like scratch itself off um <laughs> But it's quite tricky to put on the well, like you need, and like, you know, like you're on the boat, right? So there's like waves coming in and up, so you kind of like need to time it and have like, kind of like you like bop it on the whales, like with enough force that like it like sticks on their skin. Um, and then you like hope for the best that it doesn't come off and there's yeah. varying success of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like what was the attempt to success ratio? <laughs> yeah, did that? <laughs> I mean, you also need to be quite close to the whales. Like yeah. usually when we study whales, we're like, you know, like a, like hundreds of meters from them. Uh, but when you need to put the tag, like, like you need to like between like the pole reach to the well, and the pole is really long, but you still need to get a bit closer. So you don't want to like attempt, like have too many attempts in the same group either. So that yeah, that's happen. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, they're non-invasive in terms of the animal, but they're quite disturbing the technique of, of um, um, uh, you know, approaching the whales close enough. Uh, will yeah. often lead to them being disturbed by your presence, which normally we try and avoid uh, as much as possible because we're trying to observe natural behavior. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's always like a trade off of like how much, like as a research group, we're disturbing them versus like how much data we're getting out of this, right? And depending on like what your research question are, like that, you know, like if your research question is like, I'll dive do they deep and like what's their physiology as they go down, like. You don't have to worry too too much about the behavior beyond yeah. just like you know like not stressing the animal but if like your research questions are like and like my research question for my phd and a lot of luke's work like how are those whales like organized socially how do they interact with each other how do they behave then it's really important to be like make yourself as little as possible so that you see them behave yeah. naturally right <laughs> yeah also uh this is kind of a bit of a change in subject but i know that like a lot of people were very interested um about your sailing journeys and uh, croc asked earlier uh, what was your longest trip at sea <laughs> yeah i know the answer i know exactly what that was <laughs> that was a passage uh d during my uh phd so the so the main field work for my phd took place in the waters of northern chile um because previous to that, uh, uh, Hal, both um, Fish and I's PhD supervisor, um, whose who's boat we were using and some of that footage was taken off, um, uh, had been studying sperm whales around the Galapagos Islands. But they all left, they all disappeared. And so it became inviolable as a, as a study site. And uh, they went through a period in the 2000s of trying to find an alternative. Um, we tried the Sargasso Sea because there are sperm whales there, um, but it just got too hairy uh, uh, safety-wise because it's the North Atlantic, and as uh, we might we might explore in a little bit, it can get a bit rough there. <laughs> uh, and to get out to the Sargasso Sea, you're a few hundred miles offshore, so the so the safety aspect was a little bit unsustainable there um we we um you know the dominica sperm whale project was a result of that searching as well because then we, we we went to dominica but also um at the start of my phd hal got these sort of pilot charts of the pacific ocean out and pilot charts are kind of very large uh, you know they, they have an entire ocean but what they have is these things called wind roses on them that sort of show summary statistics of the wind strength and direction um, that you would experience, typically experience in a particular location. And he pointed out this water north of, in the north end of Chile saying, look, it looks really calm there. And it gets very deep because you have this Humboldt Trench actually goes down. It's the second deepest trench. I think, you know, the Marianas is the deepest one, but the Humboldt Trench there, I think it's called the Humboldt Trench, the, the, the sort of deep water that, that you get quite close to the um, west coast of South America goes down to seven kilometers. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so he said, why don't we why don't we go there? <laughs> and of course, we were in Halifax in Nova Scotia at the time. It's quite a long way. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, we had to get 
the boat there um and he said do you want to take her down i was like oh yeah okay <laughs> why not <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> that sounds like a laugh so so he took her down to florida to fort lauderdale and um I, I i picked her up with some other crew there and we sailed from fort lauderdale to northern chile and the last leg of that passage was from the galapagos to the uh to to the to northern chile okay and um we um the currents there you get this humboldt current going up the, the coast of south america northerly right and it sort of hits uh, peru and ecuador and kicks off into the so if you go straight from the galapagos to chile you're going against the current you're going against the wind um and so we decided instead of going straight we'd kind of do a a southern leg and then you know and then cut across and get into to to chile and uh and i don't think i'd do it that way again <laughs> but it took, I think it took us Regrets. 23 uh, <laughs> It took us 23 days, uh, a large portion of which was upwind um, in in quite uh, squally uh, conditions. So we were we were we were leaning and back. We'll show you what upwind sailing looks like. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, and yeah, so so that was that was long, <laughs> 23 <laughs> days, uh, of which I think a good a solid 15 were were beating into uh wind and, and and stuff like that i think if i did it again i'd just be like well screw the current we'll stick the engine on uh, and also there's less wind close to shore so you can't use the sails right so um but we would have um um you know we would have run into fuel supply issues and and things like that uh and when we returned we did hug the shore uh, and there were complications uh, there, um, largely to do with sort of fishing fleets and uh, and things like that. That also was kind of like, well, maybe that wouldn't have been so great either. <laughs> it's just <laughs> difficult. It's just difficult to get to, uh, and uh, and difficult to get back uh, as well. But we did see a. Well, we had one day off the coast of Ecuador where it was kind of like I think there were eight blue whales just in an area just swimming around and. So yeah, that had its um, had its bonuses. <laughs> oh, there's this question here. Yeah, go for it. Looks pretty interesting. Um, social behavior like this evolves by animals copying each other. What compels them to do so? What makes co animals copy each other socially? Um, so yeah, that's you, you've kind of enunciated a career-defining question for me. I think. <laughs> Um, because this, in the, in my studies of sperm whales during my PhD, more one of my major findings was that each, you know, uh, groups of sperm whales had different vocal dialects, but it wasn't that each group had its own unique dialect. There would be, you could identify, um, a, a form of dialect. So, so a, a, a particular coder type, um, which are patterns of clicks. Um, so the deal was, it wasn't that each group had its own unique dialect, but you could I, I identified five or six different dialects, which were shared by collections of groups, right? So, so each group has a dialect, and it will share that dialect with a bunch of other groups, but not with a bunch of others. Uh, and so we termed those sort of shared dialect groups, vocal clans. And it seems like whales that share dialects will sometimes hang out together. The social units are the long-term kind of stable unit. Uh, and they will all, um, um, but they will sometimes hang out with other social units, but they only do that with other social units that have the same dialect as themselves, right? So it's this mm -hmm. kind of vocal dialect system. And then we started to look into well, how 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 could this be, right? How does this develop? How does this come to be? Um, and uh, there's not a very strong genetic signal behind it. Um, there is some, but not enough to really explain it. Uh, and obviously, these were uh, groups that were living in the same area. This is exactly the same as what um, Fish found in her PhD in the Caribbean. Um, I was documenting it in the Pacific. <clears throat> and so the conclusion we came to was that um uh huh this is uh 
this is almost certainly some kind of learned behavior, right? So a young sperm whale is born into a social unit and it hears all the coders that that social unit is making and as a result learns to make them itself and therefore acquires a kind of badge of identity, right? This is the clan that I belong to. Um, absolutely, there's going to be much more going on <laughs> that we don't <laughs> quite know, that we don't know about yet. But this was the sort of broad scale uh, picture that we were that that we were getting. At the same time, how my supervisor had noted that. Um, so this this is you know stop me if this is getting way too into the weeds. Um, but but. Um, so so sperm whales and a number of other toothed whale species are very notable in terms of their genetic diversity for having very low um, mitochondrial DNA diversity. Right? So mitochondrial DNA is the is the DNA that we all have in our mitochondria in our cells that that shows, but it's also generally passed down the female lineage uh, in in mammals, and so it's a kind of marker of female um lineages <clears throat> and um sperm whales and other tooth whales a few other tooth whale species despite having large populations and very large uh, geographic ranges which were normally associated with elevated or high levels of genetic diversity had very very low levels of genetic diversity and um how being the really clever person that he is came up with this idea of how that could have come about which he called cultural hitchhiking mm -hmm. which is the idea that okay so one maternal lineage not only inherits its mitochondrial dna but it inherits um you know uh behavioral things like vocal clan dialect and mm -hmm. perhaps other things like where is a good idea to go and find squid or or, or this kind of thing and if one of those lineages is the source for a particularly good idea that is very advantageous, it will outcompete uh, directly or indirectly other lineages. And the mitochondrial DNA that is carried by those females will then become uh, much more prevalent in the population. Other lineages will um, be uh, extirpated or, or, or you know, lost, and the re the result would be that instead of say three lineages of with different mitochondrial DNA, you now have one, right, the one that had the good idea, and that results in a in a in a in a uh, reduction in diversity because the mitochondrial DNA haplotypes associated with that lineage or the one haplotype associated with that lineage has hitchhiked on the cultural success of their of the, the success of their culturally transmitted behavior and and reduce diversity in that way um this is also plausible so so we uh, humans also share this we have quite low actually mitochondrial dna diversity for our population size which is obviously massive um and there's some suggestion you know that this this idea of house might have worked as well in our evolutionary history Mm -hmm. so the idea like just to like clarify because uh, i saw like make this question so the idea is that like the those vocal dialects are learned so it's like something that the whales learn from their mothers they learn from their grandmothers their aunts like their family groups and it is not related to their genetic dna which is the dna that you get like you know like the dna that you kind of like think about like 50 percent from dad 50 percent from mom but it's linked to the mitochondrial dna which is a, a dna that's like uh so like your mitochondrial dna is like an exact copy of that of your mom and mm -hmm. it is linked to that, which like kind of shows that like rather than being genetic, it is learned through like kind of like those like mother lines, right? Because it like only tracks to that mother line DNA rather than like the DNA that you get from both mom and dad. So it's kind yeah. of like showing that it's something that's like related to those family line and kind of like highlights that it's something that is learned along those kind of like family lines. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So your your father's sperm would be the only thing that you get from your father, but but that that your your mother's egg cell would would have had uh, mitochondria in there right and that that is therefore directly uh, passed down and all the mitochondria in your body are direct genetics descendants of those mitochondria that uh, were in your mother's egg right mm -hmm. um and so there's no mixing 
it's it's just the the, fem, the female lineage on the whole i think there are some obscure counter examples but it wouldn't be biology if <laughs> there wasn't exceptions to the rule yeah. right um, <clears throat> Yeah. Odi also asked a question a bit earlier, uh, asking, does that mean that someone with enough experience listening to different whale dialect would be able to determine a clan's approximate home, what other clans they might be encountering regularly by their local dialect? Well, yes, because we were doing that, right? You, you, yeah. you were doing that in the field. <laughs> uh, we would uh, we would encounter these whales and we would often know what clan they were before we even knew who the individuals were. Yeah. right? Because we would hear coders before we saw them. We're like, yeah, that's that's a one plus one plus three. That's EC1, right? We know what clan that is. Um, yeah. You have to study them for quite a while to understand their home ranges. And, and actually their home ranges change. So one of the things that's come out more recently from the Galapagos efforts, because they've come back. So when whales have come back to Galapagos Islands, um, and in 2014, 2015, uh, Mauricio Cantor did his PhD studying those. Um, and what he found was that, because um, I had documented what clans were around the Galapagos in my PhD, and then Mauricio went and, and documented the clans that were there in 2014, 2015, and they were not the same, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so we had evidence of two, three clans when I was from from my data, uh, and then Mauricio showed that actually there were two different clans that were in that now using those waters uh, after a hiatus of between fifteen to twenty years when when there were no sperm whales seen around the Galapagos Islands, right? So these kind of processes, these population level, clan level processes, um, uh, uh, are, are going on out there. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> now these, these these sort of um, mega groups or different cultural groups or different cultures, if you want to call them that, are moving in and out of areas of, of habitat. So the home range deal is is probably not a fixed thing, right? Um, <clears throat> but what does seem to be the case is that they have these kind of broader contact groups. So so. Um, 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 you know, if if you go overseas for example and you encounter someone with the same accent as you it kind of stands out right and mm -hmm. and you, you actually probably feel quite well disposed towards that person so if they asked you to help them out you might actually be like yeah we're you know from the homeland you know we'll we'll <laughs> we look out for each other so we'll 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 do that and and, and um i think we, we we probably think very similar processes are happening uh, in sperm whales, but perhaps with less language <laughs> directly yeah. involved. Um, so anyway, gosh, uh, so now, uh, so the best thing about this format is that like, as an academic who loves the sound of their own voice, there's no limit, right? I can yeah, just go perfect. on it's and like, on. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> like, I love, like, I love these interviews because I think we can, it just like gives everyone an opportunity to go into little rabbit holes. And you never know where it's, it's going to take you, which is which is kind of fun. And it's fun to go through those rabbit holes and kind of like explore those questions. And like, yeah. you know, like obviously you've done so much work. You're very passionate about this. So it's like it's very nice to like, you know, like hear cool. the sound of your voice. So like go for it, you know, <laughs> well, <laughs> then I shall continue. Um, yeah, yeah. People said you have a beautiful voice, too. They want you to like record <laughs> audiobooks and stuff. So like, you know, like the world is your oyster. <laughs> yeah. Um yeah uh so that got me interested in the whole social learning thing right because okay uh, we, we we're here um uh and 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 we're talking to each other over this technology and stuff like that um we are wearing clothes uh, my vision is being assisted by my glasses etc uh, etc et none of those things are coded in our dna right they're all products of our innovation and then passing on those innovations and then building on those innovations through fundamentally social learning learning from each other in fact as a species we've institutionalized social learning so we have schools and universities that that actually codify and institutionalize this process um, and it is arguably one of the things that make human societies have the form that they have today so it's clearly a big part of our own evolutionary story as well 
Um, so I just got caught up uh, in, in this idea. And that's one of the reasons I studied Archerfish as well, uh, is to yeah. understand whether the ability to learn socially is linked to, for example, high um, visual cognitive performance, because Archerfish are, are, are notable for the fact that they can accurately shoot things through the air water interface and use ballistic trajectories and use accelerating water to make sure all of the water arrives at the prey at the same time, et cetera, et cetera, right? So there's one theory about the evolution of social learning, which says, well, you've got to have appropriate sensory channels to take that information in. And so Archfish would be a candidate and we're looking for social learning in them. Anyway, yeah, so I just got really into that whole thing, both as like understanding how the animals themselves come to make a living and survive in an environment that's to us featureless and also incredibly hostile for, for mammals. Uh, and um, the, the other one is kind of like the role that it plays in our own history, right? Um, and prehistory and, e and evolutionary trajectories and, and, and things like that. Um, because an individual human being is also pretty rubbish, right? <laughs> it's when we get it's when we get together and start sharing ideas and 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 working together that that we can do um, the, the what we have done in our in our you know last two to ten thousand years of our history, um, and where that ability came from, how it works, those kind of questions um, are still extant and 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 the center for social learning and cognitive evolution that i'm part of there's lots of other scientists there who are also studying these questions in 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 different species from chimpanzees to to um uh, birds to crows and and um, and also in 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 humans as well um so yeah that that you can you can spend and many multiple dozens tens if not hundreds of scientific careers are actually dedicated to questions like that mm -hmm. Odie asked in the chat just to clarify if you hypothetically inseminated a female sperm whale with the sperm of a male sperm whale they live as far apart from each other as geography be possible and let the offspring live with the mother until a certain underdetermined under -determined threshold but long enough for it to develop its local dialect then move it to its father it would basically have to learn to speak all over uh, I, would say, yeah. <laughs> I would say I would say yes uh, as, yeah. the, as the short answer there um, we don't you know the male question is very fascinating in sperm whales um, we know a lot more about the females than we do about the males because the females live in nice tropical waters where we like to hang out and you know we have benign conditions and can spend a lot of time following them the males when they reach that seems like when they reach that boisterous stage uh, there's a question earlier about how the females do that. How do they kick the um, the young males out? Um, mm -hmm. And and uh, we don't really know, but they basically, I mean, what you can observe and what um, Shane again tracked this process in one particular group in the in off Dominica. You can observe these young males becoming more and more peripheral in the social network over time, right? So they start off really central because they're hanging out with all the females who are looking after them when they're very young calves. And as they get older and older, they become, you know, the social network diagrams, you see this animal becoming more and more peripheral and being connected to fewer and fewer animals uh, until eventually it, it left and was no longer part of that. So, um, um, you know, um, sounds like a bit of a sad story right but <laughs> it uh, generally i think gets shunned out of the group right and uh, fewer and fewer animals want to hang out with it fewer and fewer animals want to spend time at the surface maybe because it's obnoxious and behaving in obnoxious ways and and therefore you know eventually gets the message um what we see in part of our study area in the mediterranean is this thing called this this thing called bachelor school so so the general theory will go this is not well studied because it doesn't happen in areas that we typically can study them is that they still want to be social <laughs> uh, and so they 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 um, find other similar aged males who also still want to be social miss their social groups and things like that and they form these things called bachelor schools which are basically groups of young males that are sort of hanging out 
with each other for for periods of time and we see evidence of this in um certain parts of our study area in the mediterranean okay and ultimately as they become bigger and bigger then the instead of being potential buddies they're potential competitors and so they end up being kind of solitary uh, and then when they are big enough they come back to the tropical areas and they um, roam around looking for groups of females and making opportunities in there and we know virtually nothing about the relationship between what dialect group of male is born into <clears throat> and then where it ultimately comes back and starts looking for uh, opportunities whether it prefers its own vocal clan it will certainly remember those dialects although males mature males on the whole don't produce coders themselves um, <clears throat> or whether they avoid that, you know, to try and avoid inbreeding and things like that. We know from the evidence in the the normal, if you like, DNA that that males actually will sometimes transfer between oceans and and things like that. Um, there's far less geographic ge genetic variation in the nuclear DNA, the standard DNA that you get from your mum and your dad. <coughs> than there is in the mitochondrial one and the and, and the, only, the only real way to explain that is that the females are staying put in their various ocean situations and the males are going all over the place and mating with whoever they can yeah yeah and there's like evidence of like like one of the males that like i saw in the caribbean while i was studying out there was also like sighted in iceland you know so like obviously like they travel like quite a bit um and the sperm is kind of an extreme animal as far as that goes because like the females and the male like when they're mature like live so so far from each other and they're like so sexually dimorphic that like fathers don't really have a role to play yeah. in the in the female social world like it's very much like you know like mothers and aunts and grandmothers are very central and important and they're the one sharing the knowledge but males they kind of like come and go and they're not like as part of all of those like social dramas that we see unfold in more <laughs> tropical areas and like we know much more about right there might be bachelor school dramas that we don't know about like happening in the med and in japan and norway and stuff but we just have so little information and that's kind of like a big interesting question mark out there oh have we tried the mirror test on whales and dolphins uh that it has been tried on what those dolphins uh and um they uh uh, react in fairly similar ways to being marked as um, uh, chimpanzees and, and, and things like that do. So to the extent that the mirror test is what it purports to be, then then they, the bottlenose dolphins at least pass it. Um, but recently so have cleaner wrasse, <laughs> little fishes <laughs> that clean, clean other fish on. on uh, now, they are sophisticated animals in their own right and uh, they have a whole uh need to keep a track of which individual which of the big fish um um they have um so sometimes these cleaner fish cheat right and they instead of cleaning the parasites and stuff like that they take a nice big chunk out of the mucus uh covering protective mucus covering of the fish that they're cleaning or or they nip a bit of the fin off and stuff like that right and that that's kind of cheating in that interaction uh and um if you cheat too much with the same fish, then you kind of lose your customers. So they have this whole reputation thing uh, uh, going on. But anyway, recently there was an experiment published which which claimed to show that cleaner fish also passed this mirror self-recognition test, um, which, you know, true to our biases, was not a reason to think, well, wow, these fish are really smart. But a lot of people started saying, maybe this test isn't what we thought it was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why we're biased towards that. I mean, that's that's pretty anti-fish as far as I'm concerned. But. Yeah, and we like fish on this channel. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, and, they are, uh, yeah, and they are also asked it earlier. Uh, I know there are dolphins that use tools. Is there any behavior like that in the sperm whales? Do you have any stories of sperm whales? Um, I, I don't. Um, we um, no, because, you know, in the deep ocean there's not a lot of there's not a lot of material stuff i mean we've seen them kind of do you remember those times you, you get these sargasso patches uh mm -hmm. in the caribbean and um it seemed like the the young whales the calves in particular seem to really like to go into the middle of them and kind of play around with them and and 
and things like that yeah yeah, uh, but... yeah. i was i was kind of thinking about the same thing like i remember one time when i was in the field like a like a baby sperm whale like a very young one at the surface like playing with like what looked like a deep sea creature that like i assume like the mom gave it <laughs> to him and the like young sperm whale were just like kind of like picking it apart like not eating it just like kind of like playing with it and like toying with it mm. and like whether or not that is tool use i'm not sure mm. but yeah they do they do play with their, and like you know like how you were talking earlier about like the sperm are like playing with the hydrophones and stuff yeah. so <laughs> yeah play i think there's yeah there's lots of that going on but whether they can use a tool for a sort of functional thing well i know. guess the depredation would that count <coughs> i mean it's using a human tool to its advantage um yeah um yeah i'm gonna try and remember what uh uh, my colleagues define tool use as so so um from from one cert under certain conceptions of tool use archer fish spitting water is is tool use yeah no yeah, true um but um um sort of a cetacean equivalent to that would be kind of humpback bubble nets and stuff like that mm -hmm. um but bottlenose dolphins all that tool use comes from quite complex coastal habitats where there's a lot of material to play with and sperm whales obviously are foraging at 800 meters in the deep ocean and <laughs> the start of the water um echolocation they use um for sure um some things we just don't know are you know sometimes i think there's been some suggestions in the literature that if um the squid that they prey on a bioluminescent right uh, and once it's eaten one bioluminescent, bioluminescent squid, then the sperm whale can potentially have this bioluminescence on and around its mouth, um, or maybe holds a squid that is bioluminescing um, in its mouth, and that attracts other squid, right? Mm -hmm. So if there was to be tools, I'm not saying there is, if there was, that would be my hunch as to, you know, they would use bioluminescence of other organisms to attract prey uh, to them. Mm -hmm. That's super neat. Golden <coughs> is asking, is what about the... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, yeah, yeah. Uh, how about the pot of orcas that knock seals off of ice by making large wave? Would that be considered tool use? I mean, they're using... It's more like environmental use at that point, I would think. Well, it's flipping sophisticated, whatever it is. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> yes, yes, I think it would. I mean, I think if your idea of tool use would include archfish spitting water, then I yeah. think, you know, using water in that way and using the properties of water in order to achieve a, a an action in the environment, um, then yes, it could be considered a form of tool use. Um, yeah, it is. It is fascinating. Um, mm -hmm especially that incredible sequence that was recently came out of the frozen planet, you know, yeah. where they, they didn't, uh, they didn't just knock the seal off, but they, they kind of, the seal was on a really big bit of ice. And so they made waves that broke the ice into smaller bits. And then they cooperated to push that bit of ice out into clear water. And then they did the thing of knocking it, knocking it off. It's just an incredible uh, sequence right mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> uh, interesting story i got a friend who was actually uh um potentially the subject of one of those attacks <laughs> uh, Please tell. he had gone to um uh, he had been invited as a scientist onto a greenpeace boat who were doing some work down in the antarctic because of the whaling sanctuary you know the antarctic was declared as a whaling sanctuary and they were they were doing some work going down there and um they wanted to collect some information about whales and stuff like that so that my friend who was a who was a biologist and, and and you know got a team of people and said okay bring a hydrophone some cameras and things like that we've got a little uh rigid hold inflatable boat that we can drop off our ship if you see something interesting and whatever and so they went down the, into this bay and they saw a pod of orcas and they thought oh this is uh super interesting let's drop the rib off the boat and we'll drive over there and you know the way much like we had in that video the whales were swimming around and things like that mm -hmm. so put the hydrophone in and they were making recordings and they were taking photos um and 
<clears throat> the um, he noticed uh, the a couple of the animals were doing these spy hop uh, maneuvers, right? Which you see on that sequence, but it's this they they kind of lift, they go vertically out of the water, so their eyes clear the surface and they can kind of look around and see what's happening. Okay, bad sign if you're a seal <laughs> on a piece of ice. <laughs> Um, and uh, they, they'd been chuntering away on the hydrophone and, and, and things like that and then uh, uh, my friend said uh, they did this spy hop in a few times uh, and then the hydrophone went quiet and they disappeared um, <clears throat> and then they turned around they heard some sort of wave noise or, or water noise and they turned around to see uh, three of the animals doing exactly that behavior, right? Swimming straight at them, generating a wave, and then diving uh, underneath. Oh, yeah, there's a spy. Yeah, that's what it looks like, just for people. <clears throat> um, and, uh, um, you know, this, this wave rocked the boat to a sort of 45-degree angle, and obviously there were bits of rope, oh things like that could cling on to and he played me the hydrophone recording that they made at the time you hear all these killer whale sounds and then there's silence and there's this massive roaring sound of the wave <laughs> okay coupled with the um um very frightened yells of the people um uh, you know him and uh, yeah. the others on the boat being you know being quite scared about what was going what was happening so at that point you know they did it once uh, and they pulled in the hydrophone they started the engine and and um you know went as fast as they could <laughs> <laughs> we're out of here <laughs> out of the bay um but they so so the the the, the um punchline to this is that they they sort of claimed this boat at 15 knots or something like that and they did it for yeah, five, ten minutes and thought, oh, that's it, we're, we're, we're safe, right? Um, mm -hmm. But it was a Greenpeace boat, so Greenpeace boats are equipped with fixed cameras that are always recording when they're out because sometimes they get into quite um, mm -hmm. you know, sketchy situations when they're trying to stop waste being dumped or something like that. Um, <clears throat> and he said they reviewed the footage after this incident so you could see the boat going oh, like this and, and then, <laughs> then planing away. And they, they, they bomb it off um, for 10, 15 minutes. And, uh, and then they're kind of like, well, we must, we must be out of there now. That's, that's fine. We're, we're safe. So they stop. And you can see on the video that while they are looking back where they came, right? Because, like, they, where are the orcas? Are they with us? And stuff like that. Another orca spy hops <laughs> behind. <laughs> they didn't even know it until they'd... Until they'd uh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> afterwards. And, uh, you know... It was just, yeah, just made you think how how vulnerable and, and how incredible these animals are, right? They're, they're legit. They can sink our boats. They're legit sort of <clears throat> um, yeah. fascinating species or set of species in their own, in their own right. Yeah, and they're at home where they are, right? Like we're just like visiting. That's like something I talk often like on, on Twitch and like especially when I'm like kayaking and stuff is like, this is their house like we're visiting them and we're just you know like we're pretty awkward and like whether you're on the boat or in the kayak or like swimming or whatever like means of transportation like you're in their territory now like this is their house and it's important to be respectful of that and it's also very humbling to you know like i feel like we're so comfortable on land and we're like so used to the comforts of you know like our societies yeah. and technology that it's very humbling to be put in a situation like that where you're like wait a minute <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, the question they stop communicating to sneak up on prey, that's pretty, yeah, um, they absolutely do that. So mammal-eating killer whales uh, or orcas, you know, in um, uh, but they've been studied off in, in, in uh, Canadian waters there. They're much less vocal. Um, in fact, they almost only vocalize immediately after a kill, um, <clears throat> which is when, you know, it's less least costly to them because their prey are also... Um, um, their prey are also listening, right? Uh, and uh, Volker Deke did this fascinating study where he showed that the prey, the seals that they prey on, um, <clears throat> had learnt to had learnt the difference between the calls of fish eating and mammal eating killer whales, right? And they did it by um, selective habituation. 
this process where they would become so that the baseline for a seal is if you hear something that sounds like a, a an orca you you get out of there right um <laughs> but because the the dialects of these of the killer whales you know, are, are so distinctive as well um over time in a particular habitat these seals would get and um, habituate to the calls of fish eating orca because they're not a threat and jumping out of the water is a big opportunity cost for a seal there's a lot of energy blah blah, blah. you know it's a pain in the butt if you're doing it unnecessarily so they habit they would habituate to the um, um fish eating whales calls and he showed this by doing playback experiments and watching what happened to the to the seals. He showed that they wouldn't respond to fish eating killer uh, orca calls. They would respond to local mammal eating orca calls. And then they took the conservative approach of also responding to any uh, uh, Unknown other orca calls. calls that, yeah, that, that yeah. this researcher had recorded in other places. So it would be unknown to the seals in that area. So, um, you get the idea there of this kind of arms race between predator and prey trying to figure out like what 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 them um, and the seals themselves pretty smart and cotton on to the the fact that these fish eating calls are not a threat to them and so they habituated yeah. they stop responding to them yeah i wonder if like the like mammal eating orcas would like emulate fish eating orca calls to like kind of like lure the seal eventually or if they're just like so like repulsed by the idea of fish eating orcas that they're like, we can't steep that low, guys. We can't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. Um, I think it's yeah, that could cause a lot of tension in the old orca society. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's super interesting. Like different gang gangs imitating their signs, you know, in the in the mm -hmm. wrong place. I think it's just uh, yeah, there'd be Very consequences. Risky. <laughs> <laughs> Let's show some uh, some good little videos here. Yeah, we spent a lot of time on the water together. But let's let's let play that one. Let's show some rough stuff. <laughs> yeah, let let's I but I think like that's, you know, like cuz cuz sailing is like a big part of uh, yeah. you know, like the research we've done together and Luke is a fantastic sailor. So uh, there we go. Welcome to another sunny day. <laughs> yeah, which, which is this Atlantic. one then? Uh, this is the pretty crazy that's the that's the voyage to Antigua. I think yeah. the the clip is titled Antigua Halifax. Rough, <laughs> edited. <laughs> this is number two vlog of day six. Voyage is pretending to steer, but actually the that's monitor is doing the job pretty good. <laughs> and it's all a little wet here because of all the stuff going on. wind just above the beam so that's good pushing eight knots quite comfortably there you go Lane yes that was flying. like quite pleasant sailing Lane's actually yeah we were flying yeah we were having a good time we've had this going on for <laughs> yeah a good 12 hours now so everything's a little damp down below but you know we're gritting our teeth Gonna last. And it's pretty. It is very majestic to see in a sea <laughs> like this. Oof. It's the only place you can come to see it. <clears throat> yeah, we, so we've spent a lot of time um, <laughs> admiring <laughs> the majesty yeah. of the sea. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, when you're out there, the only way is like through, right? Uh, yeah, I mentioned that that had been going on for 12 hours or something like that. You just gotta, uh, <laughs> you'll do that. Uh, so that was, I think, the roughest time we uh, ever had together was um, probably going back up to Halifax, right? And we had that front pass. Yeah, and the video yeah. that video is like the aftermath because we'd gone through that awful rainy stuff where it was like 30 to 35 knots for a few hours and 
poor old Ben was up on watch getting <laughs> hammered by it. And then it, pretty much as soon as his watch ended, the sun came out. And <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah. But the waves were still pretty big. Uh, and that was um, that, that was impressive. The nighttime yeah. one might have been as strong as that, but you don't get the same sense of it. Yeah, because it's. I mean, we can play the nighttime one now. Uh, but before okay. someone asks, uh, do you ever get seasick? And what's really funny. <laughs> yes. Um, is like during that video. So like this this segment here. Um, so we were. That's actually not the voyage down. That was to go to Antigua. That was another voyage. I had them mixed up. But pretty much we were like sailing to get to where we would like be able to do research, right? So like we're sailing down yeah. and we're trying to like go to the area where we'll do research. And we were stuck in this like, you know, like system that made like those like super big swells for like, you know, probably like two days, right? It took us a well, while. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that this is great sailing, right? Because it's, yeah, it's, yeah. Um, it's coming from behind you. Uh, so it's just pushing you along and uh, it, it, it's... It's rough, but it's not super rough. And mm -hmm. um, the, as you can see, we're making great speed. So we're just eating up the miles. Yeah, yeah, and it's like fun. Like you want it to be like this, even though it's like big condition. It was, it was quite fun, but it was like two days spent, you know, like at an angle, like going along, even though like quite fast. And mm. I, I don't get seasick during that time. Uh, some people did on the boat, like some people were not having a good time, <laughs> but um, my, I get seasick after. So like after like we made it to Antigua, you know, we've been at sea for like two weeks and in that kind of conditions. And then as soon as we like got to the dock, like people like opened beers and I just like got sick, <laughs> like because it was too still. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I get land sick after the ocean. I never get sick on the boat. Uh, the, you don't get seasick much. You, you accustom pretty quickly. Yeah. So much time at sea. Yeah, that's right. I did get seasick when I started sailing, and the first 24 to 36 hours, especially if it was rough like that, would be pretty grim for me. But uh, as the years have gone by, I think I've grown out of it, or or the the bits of my <laughs> sensory <laughs> biology that cause it have <laughs> degraded <give> <laughs> the same way as my high frequency hearing. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, we have the one that's rough, the, that shows underground, actually. That's kind of a fun one. Like what it looks like underneath. You can show that. So this, this is what it looks like under the boat. So like when you're, you know, like on attack. So like the boat is like angled, right? To like take advantage of the wind. So people live a bit at a bit of an angle for a bit. So you guys will get an idea of this. <laughs> <laughs> Day seven. It is the day of leaning. What's going on, Taylor? Where are we? We are um, close to Montserrat. We spent about 12 hours last night getting from where we had dinner back to where we had dinner. <laughs> so we're just trying to figure out what to do today. Yeah. Given that we'd like to be on this inshore transect. <laughs> We've had to put in some pretty aggressive tacks. Something's gone wrong with the stove. Very funny. <laughs> yeah. Also, the clothes are going. <laughs> yeah. <Very sensitive. laughs> but she doesn't mind. She's having breakfast and reading. <laughs> Casual. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> I gotta go out there in a minute. Pretty crazy. Oh boy. <laughs> so that's what it looks like from underneath, right? And then you just yeah, do the do the up. um do the four deck one. Yeah, the four deck. Yeah, let's go. So that's what it. You got the simultaneous okay. above deck version. Of what it looks like. Second vlog of the day. It's just a little excursion forward during our a bit of sailing this morning. <laughs> I just yeah. think this view. I mean, it's Pretty beautiful. Impressive. It's very fun, but it's like, it's, but it's, it's intense. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's actually less wind in this video than the first one. Oh. Right. <laughs> I like the ending. <laughs> well. Yeah, we're getting splashed a lot. <laughs> <laughs> what were you going to say? Sorry, I missed you through the noise. So, so there's less wind in that video than in yeah, the first yeah. one. Right, and the yeah. difference is in that video we're heading into it, we're going upwind, 
uh, and then the uh, the other one we're going sort of downwind, and and it, it, it's um, the the you know very different conditions because when you're going into it upwind you're hitting into the waves that's where you get all the splashing coming over the deck and the wind is uh, a lot stronger and it is pushing you over so you're healing over like that and living at an angle that's why all sailors like going downwind more yeah. than they like going upwind although it's pretty exciting if you do it for yeah, a short period it's exciting but it's less pleasant yeah so we would do that <laughs> for a few hours you know maybe eight hours or something and then we'd get behind an island and we'd have some calm and stuff like that but the the trip to chile that i mentioned before i think we had a good a solid two weeks of that <laughs> two weeks of this yeah, yeah. <laughs> um yeah the camera yeah. didn't die at the end i just protected it with my body but then i got a, a splat a massive bucket of water on my on my back which is why i was making that squeaky noise <laughs> yeah you were like we, we must protect the camera this is over I know. the daily vlog is over <laughs> yeah yeah and the the next video is uh is at night and uh this this is gonna be a uh, pretty funny because often people in on this channel uh l like i often start singing randomly um that's something that luke is aware of because i do that on the boat but i also do that on on twitch uh so this is a little precursor to once again the, the fish singing on twitch so enjoy everyone i'll start from the start and give you guys some uh, some some volume as well to, to listen to this uh, this beauty <laughs> so uh, there we go there we go it's blowing 30 knots and we're having lots of fun The moon is high but the waves are even higher <laughs> Hello everyone, it is 2am And as I said, I'm having lots of fun in the storm There's some big swells coming in Luke is up, of course Making sure we all make it <laughs> Oh, Yeehaw. the first casualty. <laughs> <laughs> we are Poor guy. approximately <laughs> one or two days away from Antigua, so we're stoked. But this is what we're gonna get until then. <laughs> so we're not that stoked about that. Especially since we only have half of a backstay. Oh yeah, that's true. So what can you do? <laughs> this is the life we live. 130 miles to go. 130 miles to go. That's a number we can all get behind. <laughs> At this speed, less than 24 hours. Yeah, because we're going fast. <laughs> okay. I've never had to use the engine in 27 knots of wind. <laughs> so this is the first. Yeah. It's a revolution. <laughs> <laughs> Morale is high. We're having a good time. <laughs> well, we are up here. I'm not sure. Anyway. <laughs> well, we are up here. <laughs> True. <laughs> a little bit more shaky down there. Anyways, we were having good fun. night, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, that, yeah. that's what it looks like at, at night because I mean, we take shifts so like yeah. we're like when we do research and especially even more so during voyage like we take shifts of two hours or three hours where someone is like responsible for like you know like sailing looking out for whales gathering data if we have to and then the other people can like sleep or do whatever they want mm -hmm. uh, in that case the weather was extreme so luke was making sure that like you know i knew what i was doing like he's much better sailor than i am i think uh, we were so changing I... watches i think i was coming on watch no uh, oh actually, maybe that, that maybe was, that's what's happening there yeah i'm not that uh i'm not maybe that, that's uh... why i was so happy <laughs> <laughs> you might have noticed that you know there's a thin line between the sort of uh, high spirits and hysteria because sometimes it just <laughs> there's a kind of you know cabin fever thing that when you're just being bounced around so much all the time things just get ridiculous you know stuff's flying everywhere and you're trying to make you're trying to do something basic like make a cup of tea and it's just a huge production and and so you know I I have literally 
just broken down in stitches of laughter because it's just so silly. <laughs> yeah, and everybody's like a bit sleep deprived too because like you're not sleeping as well or like as much as you should. Then like you haven't talked to like other people apart from like the three other people with you on the boat for like, <coughs> you know weeks, and like you're eating from cans and it's just you haven't yeah. showered. <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah you can you know you can get to sleep in the in those conditions although some people sleep more you do you get used to it and you also get extremely tired uh and so um i'm, I'm pretty sure that people were actually managing to to sleep down there but it's a different kind of sleep i guess <laughs> it's not quite yeah. as uh <clears throat> but it can get very you know on when you're leaning over like that you can sort of wedge yourself up into really cozy little places and um actually um uh yeah get some good uh shut eye um, in the meantime i can show a, another video of a beautiful condition so that people get the full spectrum so I'll show the, <laughs> the is this a dream video <laughs> that way uh, that way people will see what it looks like but it, it's a beautiful day yeah, yeah and the kind of you know, uh, you know ridiculous conversations you end up having yeah <laughs> day five vlog 8 a.m just me on watch <laughs> oh, so happy <laughs> this is the beautiful sight of the latest sails full carving the waves up into the rising sun Yeah, that's the that's the brochure right now. Six knots going on. With about twelve up to fifteen knots true wind. I mean it's got all her sail up. Full main stays up. One of the questions was um, from Pupas that says, what does Dr. Rendell think we can learn slash have learned about our own human communication through other animals? Mm. Um. <clears throat> Let's go back to intellectual mode. Sorry, we're having too much yeah, fun. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh... I was like, I gave you like a bunch <laughs> of sailing and now the serotonin is going and then we're like back to science. <laughs> Uh, I um <clears throat> right. So, so we have we here. we have this we have language, okay, and and that's a pretty special thing actually in the animal kingdom, um, for various uh for various reasons. Now we can talk sort of casually about animal language, about bee the bee dance language or the language of sperm whale dialects and things like that but um that when you come down to what what it what it means to have a language to have infinite expression from finite means to have grammar syntax shared uh, shared arbitrary meanings right the only um the only real association between the word cat and the actual physical animal is that in our minds we all agree that that's what the label for that thing in the world is, right? Um, now, we also have all the kind of non-linguistic communication, the body language and, and, and stuff like that, that that's going on. And <clears throat> it's always been a big question, right? How did language evolve? Where did it come from? And um, the, the probably the most convincing um, perspective that I've encountered on that is that actually you know language isn't one thing it's a combination of um a series of features okay uh one is learning one is shared arbitrary meanings the other is kind of being able to generate these sequences um and uh, and and things like that and the the existence of language leads to some really fundamental questions about so, so there is a perspective out there, a philosophical perspective out there that actually consciousness itself demands 
language. Like you can't have true consciousness unless you're able to articulate things in a kind of internal linguistic voice, right? The other clear thing is that language in humans is not tied to speaking, yeah? Um, because we have um, plenty of examples of, of people who can't speak, but when they are given the opportunity, I mean, Helen, Helen Keller is the very famous one, uh, when given the opportunity are perfectly able to uh, um, communicate using language, even though they can't speak and they can't hear. <clears throat> so there are a number of abilities that all come together, right, to make language and to make specifically vocal language. And the question of how does language evolve, um, at least from a comparative perspective of looking at other species, for me breaks down to um, looking at what aspects of this language thing that we have can we identify um, not as part of a whole package, but as individual elements in different aspects of animal communication. And where did those come from? What functions do those things appear to serve? Okay. Um, so um, what what is perhaps really interesting about sperm whale um, and to some extent orca dialects and, and other dialects is um, the idea that... Um, there might be some aspects of shared meanings coming in there where the meaning is about identity, right? Um, <clears throat> so if you grow up it, as a sperm whale in a sperm whale pod, then <clears throat> you acquire the dialect of your pod, um, but there's also something about you also acquire some kind of knowledge at some level that other whales that you have never met before, never, don't know them as individuals, but share the same dialect, right? Have some kind of shared identity with you such that it's okay for you to spend some time associating with those animals, even though you never met them before, right? Um, and um, and even in in sort of relatively altruistic contexts, like you're looking after each other's calves while you're diving, or if the group comes under attack by sperm whales. In fact, one of the reasons we think that, for example, in the Pacific, it seems that they do this much more. Social units do join up into larger groups much more, is precisely because a bigger group is easier to um, uh, organise defensively against. Like, you know, if you're a small unit of five or six female sperm whales and you get a pod of like a dozen orcas, then they outnumber you, right? But if you get a bunch of group units together and so you have 30 sperm whales, then you outnumber them uh, mm -hmm. and, um, <clears throat> and that kind of thing. So perhaps that process has driven this communication system towards one where we start to see some of the roots of um, the development of shared arbitrary meanings, right? And so the code, the forms of these coders uh, have nothing to do with a sperm whale in the, in the world, just as the word for cat doesn't have anything to do with the cat in the world. But to um, those sperm whales, it has the meaning associated with the identity of us right mm -hmm. even though you've never met that animal before yeah. uh, and if you hear a different dialect then you know it's not us right and so you start to get arbitrary meanings around the concept of us and not us that have nothing to do with the actual forms of the coders it's just that that's what that's the code that we make and anything else is not us right not we mm -hmm. so so there's one uh, uh, example um the other so some some other examples i can pull from cetaceans for example um so but as far as we know there's no evidence that sperm whales can construct elaborate grammatical syntactical sequences of coders that then have that then have the potential for, you know, expression 
uh, multiple, multiple expression. However, in humpback whales, we do have examples of in their song uh, sequences, complex sequences that evolve into you know that evolve into higher in, into. Com- I'll never get this right. It goes from the beginning. Um, <laughs> there, 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 there's studies of humpback song which show that um, all else being equal, over time the song in a population tends to get more complicated. It tends to have more different mm-hmm. types of units, and the sequence gets a little bit more complicated. And it's possibly in that abil- ability to remember and reproduce complex, excuse me, sequences. Uh, that that some form of competition between males is enacted or some kind of sexual selection process goes on. So there you've got not shared meanings, um, but um, the production of sequences according to specific rules, right? So humpback mm-hmm. song sequences uh, consist of a hierarchical so they have subunits and then and then units and then phrases and then themes um so there you have the aspect of generating sequences according to some set of rules some grammatical mm-hmm. perhaps rules or syntactical rules um but not many of the other aspects right and then if you look at bottlenose dolphins then they live in sort of um societies where individual one-on-one relationships matter a lot um so they live in kind of communities rather than pods and everyone in the community can potentially interact with everyone else in that community Uh, and they have these signature whistles which are whistle contours that are unique to an individual dolphin right and they sort of settle on one um uh in early life and that becomes their signature whistle for life and they also mimic each other's signature whistles in what appears to be a form of addressing so it's kind of analogous to names but the point there is that there are labels right that associate with specific things in the environment so this whistle is associated with this individual and there's been studies that show that these associations can be retained in the memory for decades without even seeing without ever seeing that individual or hearing that whistle right so it clearly is a very strong association that gets formed in the uh, in the animals minds about this whistle is related to that individual so it's like a label okay so 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 all of these are kind of really examples of aspects of language right that have evolved in kind of independent ways and in independent settings um and then so and then the interesting thing is that these species have different social structures as well right mm-hmm. so where then we can start to explore okay so so if this social structure leads to shared meanings of identity but this social structure kind of is related to the evolution of individual labels um but this kind of process leads to learning of sequences right what kind of things must have come together in in our evolutionary history in our social structure um to have led to this thing that we call that we call language right which um i'm i'm pretty convinced in that in that technical sense of language of the of the term language that that a linguist for example would use to the extent that linguists can agree on anything (laughs) which is a (laughs) sort of academic in joke i suppose but linguists is notorious for not agreeing on anything um but they will agree on a set of core features more or less uh of what a language is and i don't think we really have evidence in any non-human species for all of those being fully expressed in another um in another speech in another um species right Mm -hmm. um some people will say well that's because we haven't looked properly yet and we have these fantastic new artificial intelligence tools and they're going to figure it all out for us Uh, but i think that kind of skims over the fact that all of us have by far the most powerful and sophisticated language detection device sitting in our skulls right Mm -hmm. um if you go and meet another person if you don't share any language at all you you do immediately recognize as that individual as someone 
a bit like you within with the potential for communication and if you sit down in a room together and you're locked up for example lots of accounts of this you know people have been put in prison together for example and they don't share a language well after a while because they recognize that that is another individual like themselves who has the potential at least to communicate linguistically um they can figure it out right um mm-hmm. and and we've been listening to and looking at animals i think long enough now that while there's enormous amounts of complexity and things that we don't yet understand um our ability to detect language in others even without the ability to hear or speak in the case of you know individuals like helen keller um kind of overcomes those barriers and i think if it was there in other species it would have overcome that barrier as well the saying that and i can't remember who this needs to be attributed to i'm not claiming it's mine i've heard it somewhere else but i can't remember who's where is that language finds a way right if it's genuinely language it will find a way through those kind of barriers like not being able to hear not being able to speak not having a common language a common vocabulary or something like that because it's really a special thing really special thing Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh so that's what where i think we can you know learn about what what other animals uh, are doing um yeah yeah, like the fact that they don't necessarily have like a language as far as like, you know, like human language goes doesn't mean that, you know, like obviously they're communicating with each other. They have dialects and stuff. And it's like very interesting to kind of see like how like different animals use like kind of like different parts of what we consider language and like how different so- like their different societies and social structure emphasizes different parts of what like became altogether like a human language. Right? Like, like as you mentioned, like the part of like having like symbols and meaning the part of like identity, the part. Mm. of uh you know like those like repetitive like longer forms so it, it's really neat mm, yeah um so i'm borrowing there from from you know people uh scientists like tecumseh fitch and 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 those kind of people who are both um you know smarter than me and have also thought about this an awful lot more <laughs> than me but they've come to the conclusion that language isn't one unitary thing right it's a collection of abilities and things that come together to work as language um and then um so so people like um i'm also struck by um an increasing trend by some of my linguistic colleagues specifically simon kirby at edinburgh who um uh, is really into this idea of um, uh, so he did a beautiful experiment of how language finds a way right which is that he did he had two people interacting through a computer system and all that these two people could do was move a little figure between one of four squares right so it's a two by two grid and you could move one figure into one other right and you could move it around and he set the, the 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 these pairs of people the goal that one of them would be shown um a particular um um yeah they they the, one of them would be told right this is the goal uh, um square i can't remember exactly what it was they had some kind of goal right one of them had to communicate to the other they had some kind of goal and they would end up by putting their two figures in the right place to do it right but all they had to interact with this two by two square and and they could see where your figure was and you could see where there was right and he showed how even in that simple scenario people started to develop idiosyncratic pair specific languages between them Mm -hmm. so if i go up and down like this it means a particular thing right and if i make an l shape with my figure it means something else and they would spontaneously develop this shared set of of meanings like that so that's what i mean by kind of language finds a way right Mm -hmm. um but he also uh, is very into the idea of this um iterated learning yeah um so even if you have people communicate ideas for example by by kind of pictionary type stuff you know that game where you draw a a picture and it's supposed to bring a word up right and you've got to guess what the word is kind of thing um and how very quickly complicated drawings if you have to pass them along a transmission chain so right Mm -hmm. um become very very simple very simplified and much more smooth things to 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 um uh, to draw and things that are 
difficult to misinterpret. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that happens by a process of iterated learning. So, and, and, trans, and long transmission chains, okay? And the same thing happens with word forms. He, he would make up arbitrary languages and show how inevitably, if you, if you ran a chain long enough between people, the, the, the most common words would become simplified and, 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 and shorter, right? And et cetera. Yeah. So, um, and it's the idea that actually every generation uh, it is bootstrapping itself into this linguistic mode. And if we don't get that input at the right time, we don't actually become linguistic ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so he is arguing that actually a lot of this language edifice is built on this process of learning and, and, and cultural uh, uh, transmission, right? And we can do the thought experiment of what would a person be like if they never had that kind of linguistic input, okay? It would be an experiment that you would never do because it would be horribly unethical because I think everyone would instinctively understand that that individual, if they had been so deprived, would be severely damaged, right? In, yeah. in, in their ability to function in a, as an adult in, in society. Um, and there are stories of feral, the so-called feral children, children who've been raised by wolves or abandoned in the forest and then found later. And, you know, they're always profoundly damaged. But the, the trouble with that is it's not a, it's not a natural experiment um, because it's also, um, uh, there's possibly a, 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 a causal circle there that the reason those individuals were abandoned in the first place is because they actually had some profound learning difficulties that became apparent and, and, um, and the parents, therefore, you know, uh, as has been done historic, you know, historically and prehistorically in incredibly cruel ways to pe people with learning disabilities, they get abandoned or, 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 you know, or worse. And so that may have been a sort of circularity there that actually they would have been severely impaired anyway, because the reason they were abandoned was because they had learning difficulties. Anyway, these are sort of, sort of tragic sidetrack there, but the point is, nobody would ever think to do that experiment because we would instinctively no. understand that an individual who was treated that way, who was deprived of linguistic input at key points in their life would end up damaged, profoundly damaged compared to yeah. you know, sort of normal adult, adult humans. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so there's this idea that actually language isn't necessarily something we can take for granted, that it has to be bootstrapped in every generation by this learning processes. So you get the conjunction mm -hmm. between two of my favorite themes, which is communication and social mm -hmm. learning, cultural transmission. <clears throat> yeah. Right? Which are, like, very so well. far, does that make sense? <laughs> no, no, no. That, like, that is like, you know, it's like a lot of people, like, it's very interesting. Like, Fonny pointed out how, like, like in video games, often, like, people find the way, kind of like the language finds a way, right? Like, often you have, like, limited words you can communicate with or, like, limited, like, you know, like, emotes or moves that you can do. And if you're playing, like, a multiplayer game with other players, like, you find ways to like communicate with each other like there's a treasure there there's a trap or like i'm a friend or i'm a foe and like those kind of like languages i like, can you, you know like evolve over time to through those communities and i thought it was just like a very good example of that too yeah i see the com the comment about crouching down meaning you know yeah. <laughs> uh, and i'm friendly and we see aspects of that in perhaps other animals so, so dogs you know have this play bow the very characteristic Okay, mm. it you know I'm gonna do something that might look like an attack, but because I'm doing this bow beforehand, like it's not really you shouldn't treat it as an attack. It's not a serious thing. I actually want to play with you, um, <clears throat> and so yeah, these kind of little interactions I think are going on all the time, all over the animal kingdom, right? It's just somehow something happened in our lineage that brought them all together in this way that then leads to 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 the it's incredibly powerful feature yeah. yeah that's why i'm quite fascinated by by that process so i'm yeah. interested in understanding what exactly is going on in these animals and how it relates to aspects of what we understand now as language and um, um but also it's fascinating in its own right right how do these animals work um sperm whales are, you know we've just seen how hostile the ocean can be for mammals, uh, and uh, there they are, mammaling away quite happily in these waters day in, uh, day out. And for them, it's not a featureless void, right? Mm -hmm. um, they they probably have some representation of of 
of their home range and the habitat and places that they've been and how to navigate between them uh, and smell and all of that equivalent of smell and taste of water and the feel of, you know, um, like um, the Polynesian navigators would be able to tell how far away an island is by the, sh the shape and form and direction of the swells and, uh, and, and things like that. You know, they're probably open to all kinds of information that we're not available that's not available to us but also um you know just as uh experience and learning from experienced people when you're learning to sail for example mm -hmm. in a in a situation like that um uh, uh, i i you know i think we both probably suspect that that's really really important to a sperm whale a sperm whale that, that isn't exposed to that kind of um information just by dint of following their own group around and uh, probably doesn't know enough to, to to do very well so so hal and i have written about this when we when we talk about culture being vital right mm -hmm. that without some cultural input at the right time some socially learned information at the right time these animals actually can't become fully functioning or or evolutionarily successful or well, they probably have very depressed fitness compared to animals that do have it right Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and maybe that's a common need across all uh, different um, animals that are living sort of lifespans of a certain length in conditions that are changing or changeable or where it's pretty opaque how you learn something for yourself right because there's there's loads of ways to go wrong <laughs> in you know in the ocean right when you leave Antigua Halifax is at 15 degrees not 14 not 16 right it's there's 359 ways to go wrong and only one way to get to get it right uh, and in that sort of situation um individual learning is a high risk strategy yes i i would have not have made it you would have done <laughs> you would do well to, you know to, to to try and maximize um <clears throat> your use of the experience of others yeah yeah, do you think this is just like a me question now because I find that so interesting. Like, do you think <coughs> humans, like a lot of humans, like enjoy the act of learning, right? Like, the, this idea of like skill building or like learning things is something that like we enjoy. Do you think that that's something that's shared across other species? I mean, mm. obviously, like all theoretical, like we can't know. Mm. But... Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, enjoy is such a subjective term isn't it uh we we, we have um you know animals play and yeah. often the form of that play is is sort of um safe versions of what are very very real and dangerous things that they're going to have to do uh, or do in other aspects of their lives like hunting or or competing uh with others um and evolution has to find some way of making this these bags of cells do things that are useful in in evolutionary terms fitness terms right so it has to to come find a way of rewarding um uh, us so that we then you know i mean I, you know, I don't think it's an evolutionary coincidence that orgasms are particularly pleasurable for example right yeah, yeah. yeah yeah that's kind of yeah that's kind of like what i'm thinking too. yeah it would make sense to like reward like if you want your organisms and like creatures to like keep learning, it's good for them to like learning. Like then they'll do it more often and then they'll like survive. Right. Like I, like theoretically, like an organism that a spe an animal that likes learning will do better than an animal that doesn't like learning if they both have like equal capability of doing it just because one will do it more than the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's a theory of human learning called natural pedagogy, which is suggests that as infants, we are incredibly um tuned into what our mothers are doing and, the, and and sharing attention with our um particularly our mothers but with our parents right and this joint attention is a very crucial part of some theories of learning some some theories of education you know that it's joint attention that it's both of you looking at the same thing and and um attending to the same thing at the same time that is the most powerful conduit uh, of learning right and um <clears throat> i'm trying to i'm trying to think of examples from my own life of learning things that and i'm particularly enjoying it um but i think that's probably 
a little bit too anthropocentric <laughs> uh, <laughs> to, to to do that. But but uh, I mean, joint attention in in primates is a is known to be a thing, um, and uh, the rewards themselves, like successfully opening a piece mm-hmm. of food or something like that, are there uh, as well. Um, I like the um, so. Um, I was just uh, um, talking to my mother earlier today, actually, and uh, she is a um, part of a. She does samba drumming. There's a one of the things that she does, right? And so she has a samba group, and she was talking about how they just were awarded a small bit of money from the sort of leftovers of a community mental health fund because it was recognised that um, drumming in groups. Uh, is good uh, for generally good for mental health right Mm -hmm. Um, the feelings you get from doing that the feelings of uh, uh, connection for example uh, that come Mm -hmm. from sharing a rhythm right and that has always made me I've always had this sort of thing about well I think that's what's going on in sperm whales when they make these so often, and I don't know if um, you've explained this ever before to, to, to your audience, but often these coders that sperm whales make, um, sometimes they seem to um, uh, go back and forth, uh, but often they seem to try and make them in synchrony, like they try and deliberately overlap each other and make the same coders at the same time. And sometimes they achieve it to such a sort of precise degree it sounds like a weird kind of echo and these are the mm-hmm. initially termed echo coders and they were thought to be just a particular co- form of coder that an individual made until we began to understand no this is two animals making the same coder in very synchronized fashion um and um i think there's probably quite deep commonalities deep evolutionary commonalities between the kind of sense of well-being that we get from engaging in shared rhythms with other individuals and what sperm whales get out of it, right? In terms mm-hmm. of strengthening bonds and stuff like that. Because the genes in the background are going, you know, we need to reward these animals for making strong bonds because that's when they're that's when the calves are more likely to survive because the strong bonds are going to lead to effective collective kind of care for the for the yeah. calves, right? So the way we'll do that is we'll make it really pleasurable for them to share a rhythm and then they will know that because they share the rhythms with those individuals that those are the individuals they they're gonna they're gonna help out or are gonna help them out mm-hmm. i think i've sort of made that yeah <laughs> no, <I'm laughs> wondering, like similar to like how like you know like bondos dolphins will also like that are very close will like synchronize their behavior too and like be like so like precise and how like, yeah again, they're like mimicking each other's movement as like also like once again a sign of like you know association and strength of relation yes and also potentially a signal uh, yeah 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 just for, between the pair that are synchronized but between other animals because that's done in the context of male coalitions right coalitions yeah, of males yeah. who work together and try and defeat other coalitions of males in botanized dolphin society uh, and um you know if you <laughs> We just take it for granted that armies march in synchrony. That's something that armies spend a lot of time training soldiers to do because it makes them feel like they're one synchronous unit. And maybe there's an internal reason for that. But it's also true that arguably those regimes and those leaders that are the least secure about the strength of their coalitions because they're built on fear rather than trust and and mutual um, benefit um, are the ones that really love having their armies march in extravagantly stylized ways uh, and and in, in in great synchrony and will invest enormous amounts of resources in training them to practice and do it and then to do it in front of them in large numbers and things like that mm-hmm. um <clears throat> so i don't i don't you know i think there are connections there as well so. yeah yeah that's super interesting uh, to stay on the topic of uh, communication, uh, where Leaflet asks, are there any major differences in means of communication between terrestrial and aquatic social animals? Um, um, well, there's probably less visual stuff going on. 
So, you know, um, it's probably harder to do things like, say, I hate dolphins with a smile on my face. <laughs> Stand that I don't genuinely hate dolphins. I'm just doing it to wind her up. Uh, <laughs> and um, they, they, um, it, so that's a major difference. Light is not great as a medium. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's striking actually how much human language understanding or comprehension involves visual medium. Um, there, um, there are videos out there of, um, people saying different vowels where if you close your eyes, right, the, the sound immediately changes. Okay. And of course the sound hasn't changed. The person is just going, ah, 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 or e, 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 e. But what has changed is you're not getting the multimodal input. You're only getting one part of that input. You're not getting the visual side of it. And so your perception of it changes um, and that, that, you know, that shows that there's an important visual component to what's going on when we're understanding each other's language. Um, so, so there's that. Um, I also think that because water is so great at transmitting sound, um, things are perhaps you know, we can't be as devious <laughs> or they can't be as devious as we can be. Um, you know, there are some cases where, you know, there's studies showing that humpback mums and calves really have a really quiet form of communicating with each other when they're close by, right? Um, that's probably thought to be cryptic to, to, to killer whales and things like that. But in general, um, it's a much more broadcast medium, I suppose, because sound tends to travel quite a lot further in water than it does in air. Uh, but I think some things are still the same. Touch, for example, I think is a really important form of communication between for, for a lot of marine mammals um, yeah. in close proximity, as we saw with the sperm whales earlier <laughs> that were silent while they were clearly engaging in quite intense interactions. Someone asked earlier uh, in the chat uh, whether or not you think that whales have like specific dialects when they encounter humans, like kind of like how pets can like change their behavior when they're around humans. Do you think that whales and dolphins would, would do that? Or do you have an example of like maybe or? <laughs> um, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't have any yeah, answer no. to that question at all because I don't. Um, I'm certainly not aware of any evidence of it. Of course, often animals are contacting us in the context of training and, and, and things like that. Um, there are examples of animals apparently imitating sounds that humans are, are putting into the water and doing it spontaneously. Uh, um, I've, I've got an example of this, of a pilot whale apparently spontaneously imitating a human whistle. Um, other people have sent me dolphins apparently imitating that and you can readily train animals to, to imitate sounds that you make at them and I, I think it probably happens spontaneously uh, as well which tells you something about the motivations I suppose they get some intrinsic reward out of succeeding in copying a, a sound or that's somehow how they're trying to process or initiate the interaction that they're involved in um there was the famous case of the beluga whale who was in captivity and then would get its tank cleaned by uh, um, people who are wearing underwater breathing kit sub aqua kit but they had these sort of full face masks so you, they could talk to each other all the time and and sort of after a while they put a hydrophone in and the beluga was sort of doing this facsimile of human speech as it could be heard <laughs> through a mask like that so it wasn't individual words but it's going <laughs> exactly the cadence and the tonality of, of of human speech you know like um charlie yeah. brown's teacher or, uh, yeah, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like sims language kind of <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, leaf had asked what was the favorite paper you've ever done well so so many i mean that's like asking 
Who's your favorite? Yeah, I mean, you oh, have right, a, this over 113. <laughs> <laughs> this is we'll true. We'll just sprinkle that back there to, to you know. That, that, you that's pa papers, not children. Um. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you said that. I didn't say that. <laughs> favorite child. So do you know the... Um, you you saw that one. It's it's the one with Hal, um, with the um, the social learning of def of like avoiding the whalers kind of thing. So the Yankee whalers, the Moby Dick uh, era whalers who went out, um, <clears throat> were um, the business of it was organised around owners, uh, you know employing captains to take their ships out and go and catch whales and, and come back and, and do that. And um, they, because of that, they the captains had to be really meticulous about the records that they kept. So they wrote down every time they saw a whale and every time they caught a whale and everything that was going on. And these have been, uh, these log books were preserved uh, and they were published um in the late 1800s uh, to the early 1900s, um, as, and they, they're sort of a, an amazing data set of where every single sperm whale almost that that industry caught was caught and when, when it was caught and where the, where the um, boats went and things like that. Um, and it's all been published and, and, and put online in this sort of whaling history uh, project, and um, it was, you know, it was really Hal who who came up with this kind of idea of just looking at uh, the data over time, and he noticed this pattern of um, when because uh, the these uh, these whalers were always trying to open up new grounds and explore. You know, and so they started off whaling in the North Atlantic, and that's how the Azores became. You know, that's how the whaling was transmitted to the Azores and stuff. But then they would start going around Cape Horn, and they started to explore the Pacific, uh, and so they would open up these new areas of this Pacific, if you like, by exploring them and finding whales there. And there's this pattern that that came out of the data when you started looking at it that every time these boats opened up a new area so they'd go to for example the northeast pacific and they'd find a bunch of whales there and they'd catch a bunch and then they come back but because they recorded when they saw whales and also when they caught whales then you can work out like how often they were successful having seen a whale in actually catching at least one right or not even catching but striking what they call striking which is when you got a harpoon into a whale for the first time and <clears throat> so um he was like there's this really interesting uh, uh pattern where the rate of conversion from sighting a whale to striking a whale uh falls off very rapidly within the first couple of years of a new ground being opened up and we were like god oh, and it was a very striking pattern right it and 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 the the decline was you know 50 to 60% in the rate of converting strikes, uh, uh, sightings to, to strikes. So it was a dramatic decline. And we started thinking, well, and so then we got our heads together and really just went through what could be causing this, right? And um, so obviously we can't do an experiment, but what we could do was um, uh, construct what are called, uh, I guess, generative models. And that's sort of models which assume a sort of underlying mechanism and then generate data uh, that you can compare to um, actual observed patterns, right? Um, and so we thought um, maybe it's just the good ships, the good whalers that go exploring new grounds, right? And so the, 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 the boats that arrive in these new grounds first are the better whalers, right? And then everyone else follows. But because we had these records, we could look at those ships and say, well, did were they also better in other areas, excuse me, that weren't new? Okay, and they weren't. So there didn't seem to be anything special about those particular ships that were opening up the whaling grounds in the first place. 
Um, and then we thought, well, okay, maybe what happens is you go into an area and like, um, you know, predators in the savannah or something, you pick on the weak and the old initially because they're le least able to escape. And then you you basically kill all those off very quickly and then everything else is harder to catch because they're not old and or, or weak or, or in, in any way otherwise disadvantaged, right? Um, but the rate at which they would have had to have killed off those older whales under any sensible assumption of what proportion of the population were in that state was way above what these 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 whalers could could catch they were still in sailing ships and rowing up to the whales and stuff and you know it was just no they you know they call our whales but they couldn't have caught that many in that short a period of time yeah um so then we were kind of like well what if animals are learning and individual whales or individual units are actually social units when they encounter a whaling ship for the first time learn how to to try and avoid them uh and um then subsequently they are harder to catch right and um again that model couldn't explain it because again there were i mean we're talking about hundreds of thousands of whales here and even with the size of the yankee whaling fleet and the amount of effort that was going on there was just no way they could have encountered enough units and give and and had them learn on a unit by unit basis social unit by social unit uh to to account for the rapidity of this drop right and so then we got the model that could account for it was one where not only you know do the units that are attacked learn it learn something about the whalers and learn a little bit about how to get away from them um, but then remember we were talking earlier about how whales that share a vocal dialect will associate with other social units that have the same dialect even though they've never met them before so then it could only it could only our models could only produce that decline um if the units themselves were learning from each other when they were associating okay so you would have a group uh, and then a unit would be attacked and then the other, all the other units in that group if one if that unit was had some good idea would learn that good idea as well right and then it would be transmitted and that was the only thing that we could come up with that would that could be transmitted so quickly through the population that it could reduce these catch rates these uh, conversion rates down to 50 or 60 percent compared to what they were when 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 in the first years that that, that area was exploited um and so we concluded that that you know that actually um so it was often a common refrain right if these whales are so smart why aren't why do they just let themselves be caught like that um and uh, it you know it turned out that they weren't uh, they they'd figured simple things out like if you're a sailing boat you're being attacked by a sailing boat you swim upwind which was sometimes reported uh and um you uh <clears throat> um then you have a better chance of you know getting away from them right because if there's any kind of wind blowing those little rowboats can't keep up with you because you're swimming underwater and they're trying to row through the waves and everything like that so you have a good chance of getting away simple tactics like that that sound simple but were very different to the kind of things that you do um, if you're attacked by um, orcas, which would have been their primary threat prior to humans arriving on the scene. If you're attacked by orcas, you've got to basically face them down or somehow make it difficult for them to attack you. So there's two principal tactics. One is putting all your heads together and forming what's called a margarita, um, not the drink, a margarite flower um, kind of <laughs> shape with lots of thrashing tails and all the heads are in the middle so that it, you know, any animal that approaches is going to get a a whack from the tail or you kind of face them down by by forming a very tight rank close together and just kind of you know pointing your heads at them and and they can't get in and separate one animal out from you and you can kind of defend yourself that way neither of those i mean both of those techniques are catastrophic things to do if you're being attacked by whalers because it just makes the whalers job way easier you know you all line up and they just go boom 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 like that right so they had to learn they had to learn some other 
techniques when they were faced with this threat. Um, and there are there are contemporary accounts of animals swimming upwind. Um, there's a beautiful passage in Moby Dick itself, where he he describes how the whalers are complaining that the the whales are getting together in bigger bigger groups and they're harder to catch as if they form some kind of um, uh, you know some kind of um, pact between their nations in order to sort of work together against the uh, against the whalers. So the whalers themselves noticed it. And we talked to some environmental historians as well about this, and it turned out that this was apparently in those in that field common knowledge that that they'd studied enough of these sources to know that there was clearly something going on like that. But this was the first time we had kind of data to back it up and and um, and support it. So um, we we published that, um, and it it has to be one of the papers that's got most um, sort of attention outside. Of, of of the academic field really of, of all the ones i've i've published because um people really liked <laughs> that story that that you know they were getting one over the whalers and they were sort of spreading this information through their populations and that was how they were actually able to um you know reduce the impact of whaling on them on on themselves or increase the chances that they might escape and after we published the paper even that we may still be able to see the effects of this now um because uh <clears throat> the um Roger Payne who's a famous famous whale biologist he has a boat called the Odyssey and he had a big did a big round the world survey where they were going and they were taking biopsies from sperm whales which you do by approaching them and firing a short crossbow dart into their side which pulls a plug of tissue out okay not unlike being harpooned, you know, as an experience, being harpooned by um, whalers. Obviously, not as traumatic when the actual thing happens, but the same deal. You're being, you know, approached, and then something's being fired at you. And they said that um, <clears throat> after we published the paper, people who had been involved in that um, expedition <coughs> said that in the in the Pacific, they got in touch and said, "We absolutely saw this in the Pacific, right." that when we started biopsying animals in these in these groups the entire group would take off invariably into the wind upwind right so that was kind of even more fascinating because kind of like, well not not only was this apparently going on in the 1800s but some how those memories have been retained in the pop, in some in some parts of the population that this is what you do if a boat starts coming up and, and shooting things at you, you take off upwind, right? So, mm. um, yeah, that, that I have to say was like just, it was just such a, a neat <laughs> kind, of, yeah. kind of story. And then we got these corroborations independently, people saying, yeah, that makes sense because I've seen it totally what they do. So that's definitely up there, you know. Mm -hmm. But how do you choose between your children? I mean, really. <laughs> <laughs> are there like some like papers you like let's say and that was like some stuff that people were uh, asking earlier like are there some research that you would love to do like your dream like you know like not necessarily discovery because you don't know what that is but like research like a specific project or question that's like if i could get the answer to this this would be my like greatest contribution or <laughs> it's like the one burning thing i would love to find out if i could um yeah so yeah i did i did have a little bit of thought about that and it sort of brought out my megalomania really um so it, i would have to invent several technologies that don't exist <laughs> right now um but you know how we go out and we encounter these groups for like eight hours or a few days and then that's it they go off and we don't even know when we're going to see them again right so mm -hmm. i want a ship with also a fleet of uh, drones that follow it around, right? So you go on a ship, then you've got much greater ability to stay at sea and you're much less affected by bad weather than on a small boat like that, right? Um, and I would want to use this ship to follow a social unit for like a year or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And the drones go out to the sort of limit of the acoustic range 
so that they then pick up any other groups that are that are approaching this particular group early so you know how they're going to react when they they start to hear it right yeah so you know what the group is encountering as well and then each member of the group is wearing a uh, this is where you have to invent new technology i mean it's not that far away but it's wearing a long-term suction cup tag which allows you to record both the vocalizations of that individual whale its diving behavior uh, and um, various aspects of its hormonal state that might be related to stress and or other um, things like that, right? So that you are getting as close as you can, I suppose, to a picture of, okay, what does it feel like for the sperm whales when they hear different things in their environment, whether it's other sperm whales or potentially predators and things like that, right? And then... Mm. Let's do it for a year to start with, uh, but these animals live for fifty years, right? So let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it for half a century. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so that's what I would do. Yeah. No, that is really cool. I mean, it's pretty. Uh, it's, it's pretty. Uh, yeah. But you know, it's free. It's free. Uh, it's carte blanche, right? I can oh, imagine. Oh yeah. Much, yeah, yeah. And I think like I, it really highlights the fact that like when you're out there, like we only just get snapshots at those animals right like we spend like a day with them we take our photos yeah. we take the data but it's like such like a small thing and there's so much we don't know and like not having like this bigger picture really limits yeah. like our understanding of them but they live so far away they and like even like when we're with them you know like let's say we find a group of sperm all in the morning and we follow them all day long like most of the day they're away from us they're underwater <laughs> can't even yeah. see what they're doing there um we, we can hear them to an extent but yeah no it's true it's true <laughs> and so often we're like who are you where are you going like why didn't i see you before yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly uh yeah there are more questions uh leaflet in the chat right now uh asked uh in the discord so like when i announced the that you were coming if there are example of you social behaviors in aquatic animals if not why is it evolutionary oh okay um so you social um would mean um uh species that live in in highly cooperative groups where at least some segment of the population which are often called castes right um forego certain biological functions to focus on others so typically you have a worker cast in 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 bees for example that never reproduce themselves but work very hard to support the reproduction of the of the queen and raise um their um sisters and you have a sort of um haplodiploid genetic system that sort of supports that that means that weirdly they're more related um to their own sisters than the workers are more related to their own sisters than they would be to their own offspring if they if they had any um so therefore in evolutionary terms it pays them more to raise their sisters from the same queen than it does to have offspring of themselves um and i don't think it's to my knowledge ever been seen in an aquatic animal certainly there's cooperative groups and certainly we see a lot of cooperative behavior whether it's working as a team to bubble net feed in humpbacks or mud ring feeding in 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 or in, in bottlenose dolphins or the the sort of teamwork of um we see in orcas of uh, they, they do it working with herring shells of herring or or tipping seals off ice flows Lots of examples of cooperative behavior. Eusociality don't I, doesn't necessarily, by definition, mean haplodiploidy, um, but um, there's there's very limited examples in mammals. So the naked mole rats are the the classic, um, and I'm I'm really not aware of any situation where it's been suggested that there's anything like that kind of. Um, purely giving up an entire biological function in order to support for example the breeding of your 
pairs and things like that. Now, I don't doubt that certainly within certain species that members of the groups are helping in some way with the evolutionary success uh, of uh, other members of the group. Typically, they are related to each other. So there's a kind of kin selection logic behind what's going on there. Um, so the, I guess the short answer is no, not that I'm aware of. Um, and uh, um, the big question is, yeah, the, the big question is why? Why wouldn't there be any examples in the aquatic environment? That's a very, very good question. Most of the examples of youth sociality live, involve individuals living very close together in, in colonies that are often associated with physical structures as well whether it's burrows or nests or, or or anything like that and so i don't think we have i don't i don't think the aquatic environment is necessarily um uh, is necessarily very conducive to those kind of physical colony type structures right i mean the portuguese portuguese man of war is a colony and sponges some speak some types of sponge are are also colonies aren't they um so maybe there are eusocial sponges but it's not very you know the sponge behavior is relatively limited <laughs> i guess <laughs> excuse me <clears throat> corals maybe corals I, i'm thinking of um but in the classic eusocial colonial living with castes that that sacrifice their own reproduction to support the reproduction of others no no i don't think so Another question was from uh, Snoop Lannisters that said, there seemed to be a bit of trepidation to claim an actual culture of the whales in chapter one of Cultural Lives of Whales and Dolphins. Is this, for, is, is this from the backlash of the scientific community? <laughs> uh, uh, yes, uh, I guess that's... So there is um, such a thing as the animal culture debate. In fact, I teach a module about it at the university here, and it goes beyond whales and dolphins. Right? It includes primates, uh, but it was, you know, social learning and the study of this has really exploded in the last 10 to 20 years. So now, um, you know, it's including how uh, it goes all the way down to, to bees and, and, and insects. Um, fish can learn socially certain things birds very very capable of social learning both in terms of their song and through um some beautiful work by um a researcher called lucy applin um uh, that kind of that kind of thing um it has shown that you know they can when you give them options to open a box they they do the one that they see demonstrated way more than they do the one the other option which is equally that viable right so they seem to have this um tendency to to uh, copy what they've seen um so and there's all, a lot of back and forth and debate about the nature of the evidence right how do you show that something really is social learning um and the gold standard is to bring these animals into the lab and to do experiments on them, right? Um, and of course, if you study sperm whales, that's not an option. So everything we do with them is kind of inferential, observational, uh, and trying to piece together what's going on from the bits of data that you collect. And from, you know, the philosophical foundations of science, that is that is necessarily considered somewhat weaker evidence than than evidence that comes from experiments like if you plucked a young sperm whale out of its social unit and put it into the social unit of another clan and saw how whether it developed which vocal dialect it developed right that's called cross fostering and it's one of the gold standard demonstrations that that something is learned uh, and culturally transmitted right um <clears throat> we see this in human societies all the time um, when um, orphans from Vietnam after the Vietnam War were adopted by American families you know they grew up essentially uh, American in culture right 
um, and uh, we wouldn't expect anything different, really. Um, and so that that can be done with animals, and it, and, it, and, it, and it has been done with species that are amenable to that happening. But obviously, you know, that's not it's not an option for sperm whales. So, um, so that's one one question one area where where people debate right is the nature of the evidence and how strong is it really and the other is a more sort of philosophical disagreement that to equate things that sperm whales are doing or chimpanzees are doing or um fish are doing or birds are doing with what we know of as culture in humans is just so fundamentally wrong right that you just you just got to find another word for what for what animals do that's the phrase that i've heard and 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 been told you know um <clears throat> uh and some definitions of culture that you see out there talk about this being you know x y and z in human society so it's kind of like built into the definition that this is this is in human in human societies um and there's often sort of disciplinary um associations between that so psychologists tend to really focus on the evidence for learning of particular forms of learning whereas anthropologists really spend a lot of time thinking about culture in in humans and and find it sometimes repulsively repulsively reductionist that we would think about calling these behaviors that we see in animals using the same words as as to describe that has been used to describe the richness of human behavioral diversity um so 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 yeah we had we we wanted we'd had to tread carefully and we wanted to be careful and meticulous in laying out the arguments why we were taking the stance that we did uh, because it is controversial in some quarters um, but that that changes um, I'm old enough now that I've seen times change <laughs> uh, on that on that on that regard so uh, but it is nonetheless still a topic of really quite uh, intense focus and debate right because we don't know everything um and so there are still multiple interpretations and multiple perspectives out there and there's something unique about human culture possibly the fact that it depends on is so intimately entwined with language possibly um because perhaps uniquely among um, animals we have this cumulative process going on where you know we not only build an airplane but then we build a better airplane because we make innovations and improvements and we pass that those along socially right <clears throat> so there's not a lot biologically very different from us now um, to homo sapiens perhaps 5,000, 6,000 years ago, but the societies are almost unrecognizably different, right? And the difference is 5,000 years of cumulative cultural evolution over that period. And no other animal species has undergone such radical changes over that same period, right? So why is that? That's, that's, a, that's a key question in the field right now, right? And I think we, yes, we were quite careful and, in that, and deliberately so in that book um, to, to lay out why, you know. Yeah, so, so our perspective, for example, would be, yes, human culture is unique, but um, this isn't like a linear series of stops on a train line or, or a, a ladder that goes up rung by rung, you know. That's just not evolution evolution is a tree and every branch on that tree is growing in its own distinctive direction all the time so yeah human culture is unique and it has these features but then 
you know, we'd argue that cetacean culture or, you know, bottom, specifically we get down to the species level, we say sperm whale culture is unique. It has these properties. Orca culture is unique. It has these properties, etc. right? So it's more about a series of unique things as opposed to a ladder um, with this form, with this form at the top. Um, <clears throat> Because let's face it, we don't know what the next 5,000 years are going to bring. And <clears throat> sperm whales with their cultures have been quite stable for you know, hundreds of thousands of years now. And on that time scale, and the way that stuff is going down in the world right now, it's entirely possible that we're just a kind of little a little blink uh, in, a, in, in, in the eye. And um <clears throat> then then who's feeling like they're on top of the ladder you know <laughs> so i think that's what i would uh, I, I i figure that's probably sparked a few uh um, a few responses yeah um well yes it is a question of semantics you know what does the word culture mean uh exactly it, it, what does it mean exactly and um sometimes you just you you know is there any point going around in circles trying to find a, a definition that everyone agrees on or is it better to just be kind of clear that when you use a term this is what you mean right so we've used information you know from our perspective from my perspective uh, trained as an evolutionary biologist culture is fascinating because it's a it's a second inheritance system right we inherit our DNA from our parents, but then we also inherit an awful lot of things culturally as well. And and, and it goes down through generations and, and can fundamentally affect evolutionary dynamics. So we're very, very interested in this topic of gene culture coevolution. When does your cultural inheritance change the selection pressures on your on your on your um, on your genome, on your genetic um, population as well? Um, the classic example in humans is lactose tolerance, which is way more likely to have evolved in societies that have a history of dairy farming, um, for obvious reasons, right, the association. Um, but, but there's pretty good evidence that different orca ecotypes that specialize on different prey uh, uh, bases, whether it's a salmon or um, penguins or um, seals, uh, also have this, you know clearly measurable variations in their genetic makeup that seem to be associated with those dietary things right and so the diet and the foraging tactics that are used to capture the food almost certainly culturally transmitted within orca ecotypes right but then that has set up a, a, ver a varying set of selection pressures that their genomes are now responding to and we can measure that response right so that's a process that we call gene culture coevolution it certainly happened in human history um, and and we think it's probably happening in in animals as well the question of whether cumulative culture happens in animals is a very live one <laughs> so there's a yeah. lot of a lot of discussion going on about that right um, <clears throat> and it's yet to be resolved i think which is why it's um which is why we're not just kind of putting our feet up and you know <laughs> feeling satisfied with ourselves that we'd figured that out uh, and moving on to other things it's still a live question one final question and then i'll let you go because i know it's very late where you are uh, but this is kind of like a, a bigger question i feel free to go in as much or little detail as you want but um why did you choose to study the evolution of social behavior in animals and i'm gonna add to that question and say why do you think people should care about uh, social behavior in animals? <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, there's a question in the chat whether sperm whales are currently growing and shrinking in population. Uh, and yeah, I'd, go for I'd, it. I'd, go for it. I mean, I'm, I'm happy as well. No, no, no. The, short, as the short answer, I can give quite a concise answer to that. The short answer yeah. is we <laughs> don't know because it's incredibly hard to measure accurately how many sperm whales are in the sea. Um, <clears throat> So hopefully they're recovering from whaling uh, and, you know, we see carbs and things like that. So they should be. Um, and they're one of the lesser th 
you know, they're not as threatened as many other cetacean species because they've done the wise thing of choosing a habitat that's as far away from us as you can get. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. But that's not to say there aren't conservation issues because there are. Um, <clears throat> um, so, uh, uh, why did I cho choose to study social behavior? I think it kind of just it kind of just wrapped up in in you know you, you can't understand sperm whales as anything other than a social species really um and um maybe maybe it's wrapped up in political bias as well i don't know um but you know we we're pretty no matter how individualistic your personal credo might be i built this myself i'm a, a rugged individual person who you know um, we are rubbish on our own and we are only really effective um uh, as cooperative groups right and that 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 um where, where did that um how how did it how can we do that as being driven by selfish genes right who are sitting in our cells in you know, all our cells we should just be completely selfish so so how does this kind of social behavior evolve but actually it's just really an out an out growing of um what was really an interest in these animals to begin with mm -hmm. okay um and uh yeah, there's some some people who work in in academia and research with, with with some reason will say, look, it doesn't matter what the species is; it's really about the questions that you're asking, and you know you've got to focus on that on the big questions, and that's that's fair enough. But I've decided that the big question I want to answer is, <laughs> how do I maximize the amount of time I spend out on the sea with these animals? <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. So, that's fair. That's just... a really good answer. <laughs> um. <laughs> uh why should people care um yeah so that is also really strikes the fundamental questions about why we do any kind of research right so there is a view out there and i've heard some politicians view it that that research that doesn't immediately serve human prosperity or happiness or wealth even is not worth funding. Um, because why? Why would we? Why would we fund research that that doesn't immediately or um, in in pretty short order produce benefits for ourselves? And uh, you know, when you're, I guess, when you're a politician deciding whether to fund research or um, fund um support for homelessness or hospitals or that kind of thing those are real live questions um but i fundamentally think that curiosity is part of what it means to be human um maybe like curiosity is like what like we were seeing in those orcas before is part of being an orca right part of what mm -hmm. makes them what they are now that's led them into different ecological niches and 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 etc and, and to populate across across the world um so everyone's got their own focus of curiosity um but i think a fundamental aspect of human curiosity is understanding where we where we came from right <clears throat> Um, and are we are we alone in embodying the universe? To borrow Ray Bradbury's words that I saw from a video a while ago, are we are we uniquely alone in our um, in our status as be, as representing the universe waking up? Uh, and if so, why? And if not, um, what are the other forms in which it has woken up? And I think if that doesn't make you curious enough, that's fair enough, right? But I think basic curiosity about questions like that is part of 
um, what it means to be to, to, to be human. And so, therefore, um, as long as some people have that curiosity, then there's going to be some value in in what we're doing. Aside from the pragmatism of like, do we want to live in a world where these animals also exist? And I think there are very few people who would choose that as an option, mm -hmm. given the choice, right? Anyway, yeah, thank you for indulging me in telling uh, uh, that story. Thank you so, so much. This was, I had a lot of fun. Thank you to everybody watching as well and asking the question. And, and uh, yeah, you, you, thank you to Luke. That, that, was, that was amazing. Thank you very much. <laughs> can, can everybody in the chat say thank you? <laughs>